So welcome one and all to the Tuesday, October 13th, 2020 meeting of the Eastern Planning and Zoning Board. There is a attached to the agenda. There are remote meeting procedures. I'm just going to read uh, five or six key ones since that will I suspect we'll have some folks joining us for the first time tonight since COVID started. So in keeping with the ongoing emergency order from Governor Charlie Baker to limit gatherings and maximize social distancing and un under legislation passed to address remote board meetings during the emergency declaration, this meeting will be conducted remotely over Zoom. Attendance by board members will be remote and remote attendance shall count towards the quorum. This meeting will be available on ECAT. To use Zoom, you will need to use the link on the agenda or download the Zoom application. You will need the webinar ID to join by phone only. Live board members, commissioners, and applicants will be on video and audio. Public participants will join the webinar as attendee, meaning they are muted with no video feed from them. During the public testimony portion of the meeting, members of the public can be recognized by using the raised hand function found under the participants from Zoom or make a request with the Q&A function. If you are joining by phone only, you can press star nine to raise your hand. When starting testimony, please state your name and address for the record. And that's, that's okay. The rest, so the rest, like I said, the rest of the instructions are on the town's website on the uh, agenda, which is in the calendar on the front page. So um, just to ensure that we have a quorum, I'll do, we'll do a roll call. Strange here. Anderson Kevin here. here. <clears throat> That's in here. Okay, so we have four members, so we do have a quorum. Um, so the first thing up on our agenda is the Baron Estates lot release. Stephanie? Yeah, and I'm going to um, promote Ken Koska. But um, so this is for Baron Estates. The board will recall that um, we, th th there was surety that was placed um, to allow release of lots. And now Ken is coming to the board and asking for the remainder of the lots to be released. And he is going to deposit a check in uh, uh, the amount of around $76,000. That's um, to represent the amount of the outstanding road cost estimate. And that will bring the surety, the cash surety to over $188,000, which is the remainder of the road. Um, what needs to be completed for the road. So the recommendation is that the board vote to release the lot. Okay. Um, Ken, do you have anything to add since you are amongst them? Nope, I'm good. All right, board members, any questions or any comments? Uh, Stephanie, uh, is there any more information about those figures? Uh, those are the figures that we agreed like a year or two years ago. But the in your um, actually, I think in your packet, Suzanne included the road cost estimate. So yes. let me share the screen. So you can see. Okay, can everyone see that? Are you seeing something that no. says weekly update? <laughs> So you, you can see the road cost estimate. So Amas, um, what this does, everything that has a quantity listed is an item that needs to be completed and there's a matching dollar amount. So that comes to uh, $188,000, uh, I'm sorry, $118,000. And then we have a 10% year over year inflation factor that we add on to that. So the uh, remaining amount that would need to be put up for surety is 100, um, the total amount is $188,000 and 543 cents. 
And I believe, Ken, what you have, Ian had this on. Um, that's Cooper Lane. You, you had, um, I don't, I don't see it here, but we already have cash on hand. I can quickly. It's like 116,000 the first time, the second round was 72 yeah. and change. So the balance so is 76,000. I'm sorry, Amas. The balance is 76. Yes. Okay. And uh, the vote should be contingent on receipt in our off in the planning office of the fine. Oh, we already received it, right, mm -hmm. Susie? Correct. It already came in on Friday. The check? Yes. Correct. It's not in the mail. <laughs> no, no, it's actually in the treasurer's office. All right. Um, you, you all set, Stephanie? I am. Any anybody in the audience have anything they want to add? I don't see anybody waving a flag or waving their hands. So I'll entertain a motion from a board. Motion to approve the release of the lots, the remaining lots. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion. Strange aye. Kevin, I. Anderson, I. That's an I. That is 4 0 unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Koska. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your Good help on that, Stephanie. All right. Um, next up internally <clears throat> illuminated sign for 15 Robert Drive. Do we have anybody from ID sign or, or anybody? Is there anybody representing on this? If you are, just. Uh, Wait, yeah. If you could ask them to raise their hand so wave, I can wave your hand online, please. There we go. Uh, could you do that again? Somehow your hand went down. I see it, Bob. Chris, do you see it? Can you see? We Please. have such a long list of participants tonight. No, I do not see him. Do you know who you're looking for? I'm looking for a hand right now. Could you raise there was your a hand up? But it got pulled. Oh, okay, so Bob. Here we go. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Excuse me. There you forgive go. my uh, butchering, but that hands up. And I'll unmute him. Bob, are you with us? Yep. All right. The floor is yours. All right, so we have an a, a internally illuminated sign that's going on the building. It's uh, 96 inches wide by 42 inches tall. And it works like a, um, a shoe box. So the, the backup panel goes on the, uh, the building and we slip the, the front piece over. And those are stencil cut letters that say, and three small cabinets. So it's, so they're channel letters in essence. Yes, but, it, but, but the channel letters are on the out on the top of the uh, main. Right, street. right, gotcha. So they stand out three. Three inches. Three right. inches. Right. Mm -hmm. The backup piece is four inches against the wall. Sure. You know, that, that kind of goes in with the texture that we look for. Uh, board members, any comments or questions? Looks good. Well, maybe you'd like to follow that affirmation up with a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the sign for 15 five. Second. Any further discussion? Or any, let me just check. We have such a long list. Are anybody in the audience? I don't see any hands raised. <laughs> I don't. Do you? Nope. All right, hearing and seeing none, all those in favor of approving the sign. Strange aye. Okay, then Mike. Anderson, aye. That's an aye. All right, it's unanimous, 4-0. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good luck. 
Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. Okay, so next up is the uh, Easton Elementary School at 50 Spooner Street. Yes, yeah, so if the folks representing that project could raise their hands. Okay, okay, good, there they are. I see four. <clears throat> I think Ashley, you're one. They have them all kind of lined up here. We have. And then Daniel Coley. Whoops, I keep losing Keith. Okay, I think that's it. There are five of you. And if you could all unmute or, or whoever's speaking first, unmute. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Colley. I'm from uh, Perkins Eastman. Um, I have uh, several of my consultants with me tonight who will all be taking a little piece of our presentation. And thanks for having us. Um, can I get uh, screen control? Uh, yes. Hold on. Share, share, share. Okay, you should have the ability. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. I've got it. Okay, great. Yeah. Excellent. So um, I'm going to introduce the rest of our team. I think everybody can just do a quick introduction. Um, Ashley, do you want to start? Ashley, you're muted. Oh, there we go. I just unmuted you, Ashley. You should be able to talk now. Hey, Stephanie, just look, just so you know, look under Q&A, just so you see a note there from yes. Hartley. Okay, so let's go on to Keith. Let's see if, let's see if Keith has better luck. Keith? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm Keith Murray from CDW, uh, the civil uh, component of the group. And uh, Eric Wilson is also here with us as well. I think Vinod's on the line too, the traffic engineer. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vinod Kalikiri. I'm a transportation engineer planner with uh, VHP. Ashley is our landscape architect. It sounds like she's had, seems like she might be having some audio issues. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, uh, we're here tonight to uh, look for um, approval on the Easton element, early elementary school. I'm not sure uh, how much, I'm just gonna go through the project a little bit. If I can forward my, uh, here's the agenda. This is basically a list of the drawings that we're gonna be showing you tonight. I'm starting with the building's first floor plan. Uh, this project is a, a culmination of about a, about two to two and a half years of planning on our part and on the town's part. Uh, basically, we're combining the park view, the uh, center, and the Moreau Hall buildings into one elementary school on the park view site, uh, and also including the central administration into this project, which is that piece off to the uh, right side, far right. I think you might be able to see my arrow, which is this piece here. Um, the schools or basically has two floors. It's um, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten on the main level with the larger classrooms with the pre-kindergarten on the left side wing. In the center portion is the administration for the building itself and the common spaces so that those could be locked off and used by the public and, and at uh, off hours and different times. And the second floor of the building is the first grade, second grade portion and the media center, which is up a, uh, a large ramp, which is one of the uh, ele feature elements of the building as a two-story ramp that runs through the cafeteria, one of our universal design elements. And uh, also um, some of the high school students in the town are helping us with a, because uh, this is now named the Blanche Ames Elementary School, there's going to be a kind of a museum slash learning experience going up that ramp for Blanche Ames. I'll give you a little view of what the building might the building's going to look like from the outside. This is that main entrance plaza 
looking at the main entrance to the building. Um, behind, up of the upper floor is the library. On the left side is the gymnasium. And on the right side is that pre-K wing. And this is that drop-off area that you'll see later on in the, in the site planning portion. This is a close-up of what the building looks like with the materials that we're using. The base is a field stone material that you see commonly around the farms in the area. Uh, the upper floor is kind of a wood grain and there'll be these out there outdoor canopies where the children can go out and learn uh, and the, uh, be sheltered from the elements and have learning areas right around surrounding the school. And the upper floor is a fiber cement panel. So the idea is to try to really ground this building in nature, but make it playful and fun to be around. This is a view of the in, if an inside courtyard, which you'll also see a kind of a plan view of this later. But this is just a kind of a, a rendition of what we feel that learning area and that, that experience is going to be behind the, in between the two wings of the building in the back. It's meant to be a, of an area where the, there'll be interaction with nature, learning, and the students will be able to go out there and really, you know, not only enjoy themselves, but get to, you know, learn and be part one, try to be part of nature and intertwine themselves with it. I'm going to turn it over to Keith to talk about the overall existing site plan, but um, this view shows you the Parkview Elementary School in its location and the um, Spooner Street, Columbus Ave, and the other areas that we'll be impacting. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a, a brief overview of the school. Um, it's obviously located on Columbus Ave and uh, Lothrop Street. Uh, it's not based on um, located in about 17 acres. Um, it's serviced by the gravity sewer to a treatment facility, and uh, from there it comes back by uh, force main to the existing septic systems that, that is located in front of the existing Park U school. Um, it's serviced by town water and uh, and the site is essentially a sandy soils. Um, so it's got a high perk rate, um, essentially greater than uh, two minutes per inch in that area uh, where the existing uh, septic system is. And that will be expanded upon uh, to incorporate the additional uh, increase in the uh, student uh, student body count. Uh, on the site, uh, there's some, as you know, it's it's fairly open. It's grass. It has some uh, playground areas, has some uh, baseball, softball portions, and uh, some of the existing vegetation that is along Lothrop Street is uh, will be. Uh, protected uh, to remain. That's uh, down exactly down the bottom portion there. And um, there'll be, uh, uh, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, get through it. So those, those areas of the, uh, the baseball and softball field will, will be incorporated into new uh, played surfaces and uh, again, the softball field as well. Want me to advance? I'm sorry. You want me to advance? Yes, please. So as you can see uh, on the bottom side of the screen there along uh, Lothrop Street is the proposed uh, school building. And there's parking that is uh, adjacent along uh, Lothrop Street in front of the school and to the right there's parking as well. Uh, and as you go along that portion in the uh, northerly direction towards Spooner Street, there's additional parking. And then there will be, if you went to the left, there's going to be uh, parking out in the back along that loop. And then that'll enter into uh, the street that goes across and there'll be parking uh, just opposite in that four way intersection as well. Uh, that'll also come up towards Columbus Ave. Um, the total parking uh, counts 304 spaces. Um, and uh, the proposed schools uh, to have approximately, as you probably know at this point, uh, they don't know the full count, but about 780 um, K to 2, 115 pre K, uh, staff of about 120, and uh, 20 central uh, staff as well. The drainage system is going to be uh, a combination open and uh, open and closed drainage system, and that will go into a, uh, an underground infiltration system. 
uh, for leaching into the uh, into the soils. Um, I guess it's about it to, to be able to cover for the proposed development. If you have any questions, uh, just let me know um, and I can try to answer them for you. The parking a little bit closer view of that parking plan that Keith was just talking about exactly with the distribution of spaces um, along the rear of the building along the side here by that courtyard which you'll see it again in a moment um, parking spots for a central administrative function and then additional parking up here and then this is the we'll get to this piece of, near the end of the presentation is in front of that middle school Hi everybody, this is Ashley and Achelle Klein from Traverse Landscape Architects. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. I can. Great, sorry about that earlier. So um, this is an overall site plan for the school and um, I won't belabor what Keith said, but some of the highlights are we have three different playgrounds, uh, a separate pre-K playground, a nature and fire playground, and what we're called the Ames Adventure Playground. Um, there are currently fields being located on the site, so we are working to relocate those and enlarge the multi-use fields currently there. So you'll see we have one multi-use field, an official size softball field, another multi-use field, and another grass uh, softball field, which we use for practice. Um, the site will also have vegetable gardens, outdoor eating areas, and then also a really interesting and exciting sensory garden, which you see in the outdoor courtyard space. And if you want to just keep moving through. So Vinod, feel free to jump in if I miss anything, but this is the circulation plan for the site. Um, from the beginning of the project, we were really um, fixated and made sure that we had a separate car and bus drop off. And this is just something we do for pedestrian, the safety of the children and vehicles as well. So the main entry into the site is what you see is this new connection road, which is shown in a dark blue. Um, and this allows us to enter the site, not going through the middle school parking lot, which is a very large improvement. Access is also off of Spooner Street. Uh, the car queue is shown in the teal color here. I'm sorry, the car, the car queue, um, you can see where it starts. It's shown right there in white. Dan, if you don't mind just highlighting right that. There. And it wraps all the way around the school, uh, all the way up where it drops off at the entry here. And what's great about that is we have a huge capacity there of over 75 cars. So we don't anticipate there'll be overflow of any cars onto the street. Uh, there is a new connection to Lothrop, which is restricted access. This would be safety vehicles only, fire, ambulance. Um, and then there is a new connection to Lothrop Street on the western side of the site. Um, and this would not, we don't see people entering for the parent drop off for this, uh, but could be an exit or entry different times of the day. And then we also have shown in teal a bus loop. Um, and this bus loop goes through the front of the site. And what's great about this is that it can actually be closed off during the day. So the entire bus loop and all this paving can be re reused as hardscape play for the kids. And that creates a really seamless transition uh, from the gym entrance space right through to the green space and playground. Um, next slide. Dan, do you want to, um, oh, and here's some arrows, and I apologize if this didn't jump up earlier, but the red arrows are just noting vehicular circulation through the parent drop-off. And Dan, I think you can probably just click again. There we go. Um, pedestrian circulation was also really important. Currently on site, there's a multi-use path uh, that will stay pretty much in the same location as it is today. You'll note that in the site plan shown in yellow, uh, and that connects through Columbus Ave to, through to Lothrop. We are also showing pedestrian connections and crosswalks from our own elementary school and the middle school. Those are shown in the dark navy. And those are safe connections that will get students through to the field space, which we know they use during the daytime. Um, and then entry points are noted in red bubbles. And you'll also see the pedestrian connections for students out to all the playgrounds. Next slide. So this is something we're really excited about. These are our natural inspired play. This is the view of the playground looking at the entry. Um, this playground specifically was inspired by anything natural. So wood elements, water, plant material. 
It's framed with uh, native plantings around it, uh, spinners, steppers, um, an integration of sensory elements such as the chimes. Uh, and there's also these really interesting blackboards that kids can use, uh, climbing logs, and we're highlighting what you see here in the upper right is this really cool tree fort that will have nets and slides uh, coming along to it. I think you also get to see, feel a little bit of vernacular we're bringing in with the stone walls lining the front entry of the school. So this does actually two things. It creates protection for the playgrounds and it also provides seating uh, for the students at the bus stop. Uh, next slide, please. This is what we're calling the Ames Adventure Playground. This is K through two. This is the largest playground on the site and it is connected to the school by um, this really colorful painting that you see on the bus loop. And as I mentioned before, the bus loop will be completely closed off during the day. So this entire space turns into a virtual playground, swings, um, any sort of climber you can imagine. And it's actually separated from the bus drop off with fire retention areas that are connected with bridges and planted with native grasses, birch trees, um, and other uh, attractive plant material and habitat creating plant material as well. Next slide. And then this is our pre-K playground. Um, we used an agricultural theme to help inspire this playground. So you'll see climbing tractors. Uh, there's a play village that has a market, loft, fire station, uh, cafe. There's also climbing structures, toddler swings, um, and then a trike track, which you see wrapping along. And that patterning you see there is inspired by what you see like mode on a field. Also on this um, wing of the school is a sensory garden. There's musical elements and bioretention areas um, framed in this outdoor porch, which Dan mentioned before. Uh, next slide. And then these are just some planting highlights that we wanted to touch upon. Uh, buffering was really important to some of the neighbors, specifically, um, where you see the new buffer, Dan, if you don't mind pointing that out, where we have a patch of existing trees to remain, that was a really important piece where those trees were surveyed and we intend on maintaining them. And we're also adding to that buffer with um, existing evergreen planters. There's also the edge along both Thrip Street, which there is a row of existing trees as well. So those trees will be maintained and there was some concern by butters of um, headlights going into their homes. So we're also planting those with um, evergreen trees as well that will get tall enough to block any sort of views coming out. And then new street trees throughout the site, uh, combinations of London plane trees and then shade trees in all the parking lots, uh, similar to red oaks. And then across the board, this will be a LEED certified project. So all plants are selected for drought tolerance and then specifically in the sensory gardens and courtyards, but habitat creation and bringing in different elements like smell, even a little bit of taste with some blueberry plants. Um, and different things like that. So um, are there any questions before we move on? Great, Dan, I think next slide. So um, we just wanted to touch really briefly on the photo metrics of the site. This is a photo metric site plan. It basically is showing that we, um, all of our lighting with the exception of the flagpole light are all down lighting and none of the light from this building escapes our pro the property. It all stays very close to the, um, the areas that are being lit and our, our, the concept is that we are no over spillage as one of the uh, lead credits that we're going after. Oops. I think I'm gonna let me know and speak to this. So as uh, Ashley pointed out earlier, one of the key elements of, uh, of the access plan for, for the school is, is this new north-south connector road that's, that's shown, you know, the top portion of it is shown in purple on this graphic on the right side, connecting to Columbus Avenue. Uh, that new connector road not only accommodates uh, the access and egress needs for the, the consolidated school, but also it helps uh, mitigate some of the existing concerns within the school complex. So it, it, it became a very key feature of the overall traffic solution for this project. Uh, and as we laid, laid the, the roadway out for, for design and, and, and advancing through this process, uh, 
we noticed that the geometry of that new access road cuts through the middle school parking lot. Uh, if you were to compare this plan to uh, an existing condition, conditions aerial graphic, a lot of the purple area that you see at the bottom, including the purple of the, uh, the roadways is actually parking and circulation for, for the existing middle school parking lot. And to be able to accommodate this new access road would be cutting into that. And so we were looking at ways to phase the, the impacts and, and improvements to that parking lot as it, as it would result with, with this project. So the way we have phased the plan that you see here, uh, essentially you, you see three phases. So under the base bid or, or under the, the, the contract documents, the base uh, contract documents, you would see modifications to the bottom end of the middle school parking lot that's shown as phase one in the purple area. That's where the new uh, or the modified parking lot driveway would become the fourth leg of that intersection of Spooner Street and the new access road. Fourth leg would be the, the driveway for the middle school. Um, and as you get to the top of, uh, top of that parking lot, Currently, the access into Columbus Avenue from the middle school parking lot will end up being very close to where that new connector road is, is going to connect into Columbus Avenue, where that purple road is shown on this plan. So we developed a phase two geometry that you see in, in uh, salmon color on the, on the graphic, orange salmon color, that creates some separation between the new intersection that we are creating on Columbus Avenue uh, where Western Avenue and the new connector road intersects, the four-way intersection, the access to the middle school parking lot is separated out, you know, farther to the west where you see it on the plan. And that helps keep the middle school traffic away from that new intersection that we're creating in Columbus Avenue. Uh, now that piece of the work, uh, from my understanding in talking to uh, to the project team members, you know, that wasn't something that was anticipated originally. So we are showing that as a phase two improvement on top of what you would build as part of the base bid that's shown in purple. And then on top of that, after doing phase two, that that would still result in some parking loss with, with the middle school parking lot, you could incorporate the rest of the parking lot, which is shown in green, uh, which is phase three, which can help improve uh, the overall parking lot, the circulation, the, the streetscape, uh, as well as the landscape amenities within the parking lot can undergo a dramatic change. And I don't know if uh, Ashley you have a plan or graphic that shows uh, what that could look like. But overall, you know, as part of a phased implementation, if you even if you were to start with a phase one base bed with a with certain amount of parking loss in that middle school parking lot, and then you improve upon it a little bit with phase two, and then you make a much more dramatic improvement to the overall parking lot and circulation for the middle school uh, with phase three. Again, phases two and three that you see on this plan were not really part of the original contract, but these are opportunities that we have identified to help improve uh, the circulation and access for the middle school parking lot, uh, if that was something that, that the town was looking to pursue. Do you want to add anything to that, Dan, on, on the phasing? Yeah, thanks, Vinod. Um, and that's, I think, wraps up our slides. So it does. So I think we were we are now open for the many questions that I'm sure everybody has. Well, thank you all for the uh, great presentation. And uh, looking at all those play structures makes me yearn for a younger day. We were, we, we had a, a stagnant water-filled tire we got to roll around the parking lot and that was about it. So Stephanie, um, do you have anything you'd like to? Um, yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, one, I didn't see any signage or directional markings on the roads, which I think are important um, to direct traffic around the loop and maintain it. I, di I didn't see those in the plans, so I would suggest adding that. I did comment on the parking and I couldn't figure out why they were adding 
28 spaces for 200 square feet of space. It was pointed out to me that the administrative offices were going to be located there. I had missed that. Um, I did not see a loading area shown on the site plans or the architectural plans. It's actually right back here. Okay. So if you if you look at that, and I think I believe, I think we may show it in the. Uh, um, it's on the civil plans tab. Is it on this drawing here? Yeah, right here. Yeah. So there's actually a loading zone there. Okay. Good. It's at the service area for the building. Yeah, um, I, I, the dumpster location was provided. I did not see where snow removal or snow storage was shown. Okay. Uh, I don't think Dan, we have if you want to, do you want to, uh, we actually don't have a plan currently in this set showing snow storage. However, this has been something that's uh, been vet with uh, the building committee as well as um, uh, maintenance. So Dan, in the corner, and you know what, maybe the easiest thing is we're happy to provide a plan that actually highlights all of these areas, but we have provided corners specifically at the bus drop off um, where it outlets basically where the swings are and you see that, um, Dan, if you keep going, yep, there's one there and right there, yep, and on here. both sides provides yep. no storage removal. Also on Lothrop Street where there's the emergency exit and or entrance, that corner provides another amount of snow storage as well. Okay, yeah, Walter is indicating as such through the Q and A. Um, then the, the other comment I had was you talk a lot about the demolition and disposal um, and, and that stockpiles will be adequately protected. I'm assuming, of course, that this whole site will be protected with mm -hmm. construction fencing and um, that materials will not be stockpiled for long periods of time during demolition? That's correct. Yeah, the, um, the, the building is gonna stay, the park view will stay occupied and learning will continue while this building is built. Right. So the entirety of the back portion of the site will all be fenced mm -hmm. off and everything, all construction activities will remain in that area. Nothing will come outside there. Yeah. And then I, I just have a question that came up as you as Ashley was going through the play structures. Are the play structures accessible to all users, um, including those with disabilities? So um, the play structures, all the playgrounds have a certain percentage of ADA accessibility for the structures. Um, and they have been reviewed by playgrounds to consultants to make sure each playground has that capacity. All the swing sets will have ADA swings. Um, where possible, any of the climbing structures will have transfer stations. And then we have ground mounted um, playground equipment as well to make sure they are ADA accessible. And then and most importantly, all the surfacing is ADA accessible across the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then just my last comment is Wooded and Curran, um, have reviewed the stormwater management system. I spoke with Stephanie Kaiser on Friday. They were just wrapping up their initial report. I looked on Permitize, they haven't submitted it yet. I will um, make sure that Stephanie gets that to you folks so that you can respond. Okay, great. Hi, uh, okay. hey, board members have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, is energy efficiency something that has been considered for this building? Um, you mean renewable energy sources or just an, an overall energy efficiency? Overall energy efficiency. Yeah. Uh, you, have, you have heating systems, you have uh, lighting, yep. you have all that. Uh, plus yeah, the fact that well-designed buildings, they will need to use less of that too. Correct. The, um, the building is, um, the building's being designed for to meet or lead silver. Um, if we could get higher than that, we will. And I believe that we're um, our energy savings is in, in the 30s, uh, almost 30 to 35 percent range over code. Um, it's a highly insulated envelope. To uh, and then highly you know, that's the roof and the walls and the windows and the entire envelope is highly insulated to reduce the amount of energy use overall. 
So renewables wise, we don't have any renewables because I believe there's a, that the town already has maxed out some of the renewables that are out there. Yeah, so we can't really, we don't have an option unless we put this on the building for ourselves, meaning that we, but the building is designed to have a full solar field on the roof if in the future the town decides to do that. Understood. Uh, another question, uh, is easy or maintenance, both for cost, durability, running cost, is that something that uh, cross the, the, the requirements for the design? Um, I missed the first part of that. Easy of maintenance. Easy of maintenance. Ease of maintenance. Ease yes. Of maintenance, yes. Yeah, that is always a, a hallmark of it. I mean, we, we design all our buildings with the understanding that the school buildings tend to need to be very low maintenance buildings in the long run, and they're all designed for a 50 year lifespan. So we're, um, it's one of the reasons you see like we're using stone at the base because that's a highly durable material. Even the phenolic panels are dur very durable. Um, and anything that is not as durable usually ends up higher so that it's not in, within reach of anyone or it's not something that would be hit by anything. On the inside of the building, we try to keep the material simple and easy to clean, easy to maintain, and uh, you know, long for the long run. I mean, they may on the upfront cost a little bit more, but the idea is that they cost a lot less over the time of the ownership of the building. Well, that that's the point. Uh, sometimes yeah. you need to invest in order to have, for example, flooring. What do you do for flooring? Most of the building is linoleum. Mm -hmm. So it's linoleum tile, so you can pop them out if you need to. And the maintenance for that is basically washing them. You just mop yep. them. You don't actually, you know, we, we steer very clear of any VCTs or anything that needs waxing or stripping or any kind of that material. We try to keep everything very, uh, there's very little carpet in the building. There's carpets, uh, but you know, the elementary schools, they, they tend to like to have some carpet around, but we, we mainly trying to minimize the amount of carpet. Um, the entrance plot, the entrance way of the building, the first floor is the terrazzo. So that's a material that'll last beyond probably the life of the building. Um, and then you go to the wall, there's a protection on the walls is a large format ceramic tile. So the material we find that, you know, there's, it's, it's no matter who rubs up against it, no matter how many backpacks rub up against it, it lasts forever. So it's the same, same uh, thoughts about the heating and cooling systems? The heating system, heating and cooling system is displacement. So it's uh, relatively silent when it's running. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, there are very, very few, you know, it's channeled through VAVs and controlled by um, carbon, carbon, dioxide, you know, carbon monoxide sensors in the rooms to, to kind of dial up and down how much air is being provided. But the idea is for it to be very low, main, again, low maintenance and very low noise because Acoustics are super important for educational facilities and um, long-term ease of, you know, low cost and high energy efficiency. It's also some radiant panels sprinkled in. Okay. Any other board members? A couple of questions, I, th I think probably for Vinod. You mentioned that this uh, Col Columbus Ave tie-in kind of became one of the focal points in your, um, I guess, traffic plan for a layman. Could you kind of run me through the the the, pro the thought process there? Sure. Uh, so currently, the way you have that intersection configured, so you have Columbus Avenue uh, running east-west, and then sort of the extension of Columbus. Uh, the extension of Columbus Avenue, yeah, as you see on that graphic yeah. with the arrows pointing to, that kind of dives down into the middle school parking lot and Western Avenue comes in from the top. So essentially you have a three-legged intersection with Western Avenue forming the, the T portion of the, the stop patrol approach. Uh, when we introduced the new North-South connector road that you see on this graphic, Essentially, the, the new access road and the access to the middle school parking lot, you, you see right there, they're very close to each other, too close to comfort. And, you know, just working through the traffic study and, and listening to comments and feedback through the process over the last couple of years, 
uh, access to the middle school and pedestrian bicycle access and all of those were, were always a concern and there was always a desire to help improve those conditions uh, as part of this plan. So one of the things we looked at early on is when we introduced this fourth leg of the intersection of the Columbus Ave, Western Avenue intersection with, with the connector road coming up north as, as the fourth leg, that we would want to create some separation to the middle school parking lot access, which is essentially what you see in that orange color in phase two. So by doing that, we are making it more of a 90 degree intersection, east, west, north, south, uh, and the access to the middle school parking lot is separated from the Western Avenue intersection. And that helps clean up the geometry, it helps improve safety for both vehicle as well as pedestrians and bicyclists that, that would be traversing that section of road. And that also provides the opportunity to be expanded in the future to integrate a, a potential phase three that can further improve the, the bike ped amenities within that parking lot. Each, each phase kind of builds upon the previous phase uh, and each phase can stand alone by itself. But the, the hope is that, you know, you would at least start with phase one, hopefully phase two together, help create that separation up front. And then as time and funding permits, you could expand to add in phase three and, and make a, a much more significant and meaningful improvement to that parking lot. I guess you sort of uh, started to touch on my follow-up question, which is, you know, in the event that phase two and three don't move forward, is there a concern that the middle school uh, parking lot will become overburdened by this sort of tie-in and the way it'll be configured? Uh, I would say, I mean, we, we looked at uh, phase two, there are few different alternatives. I mean, what you see is sort of a desirable phase two geometry that you see on this graphic. There is sort of a, a, a lower scaled version of phase two that still helps improve the separation from uh, Western Avenue uh, and the new connector road, but doesn't give you all of the parking that you see on this plan in the north side of the middle school parking lot. But that would be a much lower cost improvement and still provides that separation benefit that we are talking about at a much lower cost. So it's you could almost, I mean, without making it too complicated, you could almost phase the phase two improvement by going in with a much smaller fix up front that fits hopefully fits within the budget of what we're talking about, and then go to a phase two, which requires a little bit more expenditure. And then phase three at a at a later date, which would be uh, yet another level of investment. But there is a solution that that you could implement to create that separation without building all of phase two that you see here. And you know that that's not shown on this graphic, but that's something that we could review offline as well if, may, if needed. Uh, Thank you. Walter is raising his hand. Let me see, Walter. I have a following up question on this one. I would assume that the times uh, in between the two schools, between the middle school and the early elementary school are different for high traffic uh, times. Is that correct? That's, that, correct. That, that's an excellent point. That is correct. So yeah, the middle school and high school, uh, you know, the, the, the start time is, is just before 8 a.m. So the half hour before the 7.30 to 8 is when the middle school and the high school traffic is circulating on these roadways. And then by the time you get to the Parkview Elementary School start time, which is a little after nine o'clock, the high school and middle school traffic is already, you know, it's either in the parking lot in the morning or they're already gone in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, I, I have another question. I will assume that this uh, planning was uh, taking in consideration the local police department and the fire department and they have seen this? Yep. Yes, they've all been involved with it. I mean, this was one of the, 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 the addressing of the campus traffic issue was, a, was one of the primary goals of the project. And there was no thought of even bringing the school over here if we weren't gonna look at the, this campus holistically and try to alleviate the, and that's how, where this, this graphic comes from is, as we you know created the the patterns for the new school 
this was an over this was a natural overflow of that this is kind of the what happened after we figured out what needed to happen in order to you know reconfigure the flow and the patterns here we it seems very likely that some portion if not all of phase two will make it into the the base bid right now as we're as our estimates are going um, phase three probably not but that does mean that the two pieces of the circulation will get addressed so yeah. are, are they going to are there going to be any traffic lights especially on that critical corner of columbus app there's no plan for any traffic lights. Was was the initial was the initial plan that um, sort of prompted or the initial study I should say that prompted the the tie-in was the concern that there was going to be traffic that went directly through the middle school parking lot in order to access the elementary school. So I, I, would, I wanted to jump in before when, when Vinodo was addressing your first question, Robert, um, but that your question kind of ties right into that. Um, that corner of the parking um, lot. Walter, and, yeah. Could you, uh, could you just state your name for the record? Sorry, Walter Hartley with PMA Consultants. We're the uh, owner's project yeah. manager for the town. <laughs> I see you now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just great questions on that. Um, so that parking lot although it's not part of our project was always a concern as we were coming up with this um, and that phase one which we're including in the base bid now really helps the district alleviate a lot of the issues that are happening in that parking lot and um, stops the traffic from getting over to areas where it's not warranted um, right now they're using cones to do that um, but yeah they the, the way that that's configured now in the purple being included in the base bid is going to alleviate the traffic. It, 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 what it does is it lets traffic out onto three different areas potentially um, instead of just the one that the middle school has now. Um, and I'm sorry, I missed the second part of your second question. Um, that what was that? No, I think I think you actually touched on it. I mean, I, I guess I was trying to more figure out what the the main issue was that that this was going to address and I, I think you guys have done a really nice job articulating that for me so I thank you uh, one, one thing I do want to touch on Dan if you if you could pull up the one of the graphics that shows the bottom end of the, the new connector road uh, just want to point out something really yeah right there so to the question earlier about uh, fire and police feedback, uh, I know Ashley touched upon this early on in her presentation. Uh, we did review this with the police and fire departments and one of their comments was about, you know, whether traffic turning into, into the new connector road from Lothrop Street could block emergency vehicle access up and down Lothrop Street. You know, vehicles are slowing down to turn left or right into the new access road. And specifically to address that concern and through our design and looking at the numbers, we had noted that especially during the school peak times that that new access road, the, the bottom end of it would be exit only. So there would be no vehicles lining up on Lothrop Street. So the concern that the police and fire department had of, of you know, parent vehicles blocking emergency vehicles fully disappears. So during peak times when parent vehicles are on the streets, that access curb cut on Lothrop Street would be exit only. During other times of the day, the school can choose to open it up for enter and exit, exiting traffic, you know, pending review of actual operations. But during peak times, uh, we had recommended that it, it be limited to exit only. Greg, if I may ask a question as a follow-up to that. Yes. Um, so we'll, um, you know, will those, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are no directional markings shown or signage indicating that um, it's one way or not. But I'm assuming that you will have markings, road markings and signage. The, yes, the, the, the circulation plan, the, the site layout will be accompanied by, you know, traffic signage that would indicate, you know, no left turns or no exits during certain hours of the day. Uh, all of the traffic signage uh, that would be needed to facilitate the circulation plan will be part of the part of the design. 
Thank you. During pickup and drop off, there is a gate closed on the other axis, uh, on the on the right side there. The right yeah, here, this one here. That's yeah, always yeah. closed. That's always, always gated. That's always closed. So it's only open when there is access needed for some reason. There's only act. Yes, that was act. That was only the um, both the fire department and the police department wanted to be able to take this turn and go in and get to the building quickly. So that's what that's there for, and that that gate is only for them. Okay. Are there any more questions from board members? Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for this presentation. I think everyone in this town will appreciate this project and you guys have done a very good job at thinking of all the pinch point circulation paths and how they cross. Um, the only downside I can see from a potential residence is in that upper right corner, like you talked about where you're gonna have additional trees um, to remain because that mm -hmm. Uh, road now, I believe, is just a service entrance to the um, school where now it'll become like a main thoroughway. Um, so no question, but um, obviously you guys have considered all the other potential options. I think it's very good looking. I wish I could go to this elementary school, <laughs> but I have a daughter that'll be there. So that would be great. Chris, are you talking yeah. about Spooner Street? Yeah. Yeah, that's where a lot of um, a lot of the traffic comes in now. And this um, this homeowner right, that has been, yeah, yeah, they have been very active, and you know, at I would say almost every single meeting we've had, they've attended, and they have asked questions, and they've been very engaged, and you know, the uh, they've had an effect on the design, and I can so imagine, that, you know, yep. yeah, Good. to so that we've 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 tried really hard to address all of their concerns and, and make sure that they feel comfortable with this there should be no surprises um no you know as we as we go through uh, based on what we've feel we've presented um they and dan's right they've been at 99 percent of the meetings yeah i mean Great. they went no, I they, think that's this is, uh, excellent that's why we did this this was right. a, specifically a request by them to maintain those trees and, and we you know we agreed that that should happen so we we made those changes but there's been others. So they've been very, very engaged. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just have two quick questions. One, um, in, re in regards to the, the rain gardens, the, I'm assuming there's a maintenance, um, operations maintenance plan. Uh, and is that part of Woodward and Curran's review or uh, obviously the town building is gonna be maintained by the town, but I know we've had issues. We, we've approved many rain gardens through the years and they don't end up uh, staying rain gardens. I'm sure it'll be different with the town, but I'm just wondering what the plan is for that. And then uh, a question for Ashley would be if she could just touch base uh, or on the surface materials of the of the uh, play areas, what they are. So Keith, I'll let you weigh in. I'll just touch lightly and maybe I can speak to the planting aspects of the rain gardens. But um, we have definitely worked to create native plantings in the rain gardens, but also we look to use grasses and large massings of plantings, which we've been much more successful with. So in terms of maintenance, as opposed to having individualized plants, which you have to cut one one point or deadhead another one another, um, you know, when you, we put these ornamental grasses and perennials together, spring and fall, you can just cut them down in one fell swoop. Um, and then aside from that, you also have um, regular cleaning of the maintenance, just taking debris out. But certainly, uh, we find you know grouping these plants, you know, that are native drought tolerant, um, that's really really helpful in terms of maintenance. And that's something we've looked at site wide, where we don't have really really intensive plantings um, aside from that courtyard area. The play surfacing, um, we have reviewed multiple options, and we are using the port in place rubberized play surfacing. This option by far we find to be the best in terms of a maintenance perspective, in terms of being AD accessible uh, and meeting all the safety and fall requirements that are necessary. And Keith, did you want to speak a little bit more to the maintenance of the rain gardens and in terms of creating a plan for that maintenance? Um, yeah, and actually Eric may also uh, want to chime in on this as well. Um, but in, in general terms, uh, rain gardens are 
uh, fairly low maintenance. Um, they're, they're meant to be that way um, because you want to be able to have them um, succeed. They're going to grow kind of on their own. Um, there's going to be some pruning. There's going to be obviously sometimes so depending upon, you know, you get some animals in there that uh, might uh, attack or, or um, make an impact to those areas and they'll, they'll over, over time they'll need to be replaced. Um, but in general terms, uh, rain gardens um, are self-sufficient. Uh, they can, they'll be self-watering with typical rain and they'll be, and they'll uh, be augmented by uh, roof runoff. Um, so they're fairly, fairly low maintenance. Um, Eric, did, if you had anything else to add, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, Eric Lobson, TVW. Uh, I guess I'll just mention that the, the rain gardens themselves are relatively small in the overall scheme of the whole stormwater management system. So we're, we're not actually accounting for them, providing volume because they're, they're so small. Um, stormwater management for the site is really by the underground infiltration systems. Um, That's so, right, I thought they almost looked aesthetic, you know, as an aesthetic yes, very, next, next to the playground. And because yes. we know what it is, once we get through the presentation, once we build this thing, we're two years out, you know, uh, Probably won't be a lot of deadheading going on, you know, and things. But all right, so I, I, maybe I should have started that way. Is it? I thought maybe it was more of an aesthetic part of the uh, part of that playground. And okay. just uh, oh, out of my ignorance, so the poured in place rubber is that uh, pervious or impervious? I'm just curious. So it's not counted um, as pervious. It is somewhat um, pervious, but it's not counted like that in the drainage calculations. Okay. So there will be drainage provided for those playgrounds, and they'll all be pitched to drain. Great. And connect to the drainage system. So that's everything I have. Board members, do we have anything else? No. Okay. Um, anybody in the audience waving? I don't see anybody waving. I didn't see any hands up. And so, Stephanie, I know you touched on this, but where are we with Woodward and Curran? Are we we're still waiting? They, um, so they finished their review. I talked with Stephanie Kaiser. There were. Um, some of the typical discrepancies that you'd expect from a large stormwater system um, that m could easily be resolved um, once we get that report to um, the applicant. Um, so I would expect them to be able to review it and make any revisions or changes or provide updated calculations. Um, and then be able to continue and likely close at the next meeting. All right, well, um, so I wanna thank the team. That was a great presentation and uh, looks like it's a fun, exciting, uh, important project for the town. So we thank you all for your, uh, for your efforts and we look forward to a uh, successful conclu conclusion. Um, so, uh, we don't really, this is site plan review. Do we need a motion to continue? Uh, technically you don't, but it never hurts. Okay. Anybody want, want to chime in? What is the date to continue 50 Spooner Street? September 26th. So until September 26th. October. Oct I'm Oct sorry, October. Sorry. Oct yeah, that wouldn't make sense. October 26th. Second. All right. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor. Strange aye. Okay, then Mike. Anderson, aye. That's an aye. All right. Thank you, one and all. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right. So now uh, we have a continued public hearing for Sawmill Village, 560 Foundry Street. If you want to be, uh, if you're presenting, why don't you raise your hand virtually so Stephanie can count yeah. you in. I see a couple, Jonathan and Megan. Oh, yeah. Yep.
Okay, and John, you should be able to share this, um, share your screen. Oh, okay. You guys can hear me okay? I can hear you. Yep. And again, um, Jonathan, if you could just state your name for the record. Uh, for the record, Jonathan Novak, Conoco Engineers and Scientists. Uh, Walter Mirion is also on with us as well. Um, we've been, it's been a little while since we've been in front of you. So uh, I guess the easiest thing to do is to kind of discuss uh, where we were the last time and uh, where we've ended up. Uh, this was the last layout that we previously had um, showing the long cul-de-sac with 20 units um, The on the western side. The eastern side has not uh, changed for the most part. Um, the western side did change based off of the some concerns from the Conservation Commission um, regarding proximity uh, to the wetlands and then also some of the isolated wetlands that were in the middle. Um, we've actually revised this plan set and the layout of that side to show um, two separate little branches uh, and it reduces from 20 units to 18 units uh, for to avoid um, as much wetland impact as possible. So just to get a better zoom in view of it. Um, this is the current layout along the western side. Uh, and as you can see, we're avoiding previously this was going to be this isolated wetland was going to be impacted. Uh, and then we were pretty close to some of the stuff out back here. So we've gone through and we've adjusted um, and to be able to maintain amount a certain amount of units, and then also reduce uh, the impact to the wetlands as much as possible. Um, there are been some slight changes to what's for the utilities going along in the crossing uh, from the original. Uh, we were going to be hanging it up through the crossing. We're now going to be doing a directional drilling. Um, it's standard. It, it's nothing crazy. It's not a new technique. Um, and then the eastern side again, um, the drainage. There was some um, clarifications that we went through with Woodard and Curran. Uh, they issued a letter um, about two weeks ago, beginning of October. Um, a, the, and the majority of their comments, uh, again, you probably have seen it, um, were to the fact that we addressed their concerns. Any of their outstanding issues that they have were in the process of addressing and then we will be providing a new revision to incorporate all of the responses from that review letter and then any comments that um, the board and the town may have uh, for one last final uh, design from us and then you can see here on the western side where we did the majority of the the work the modification as opposed to the road coming out and then root looping back down here, we've gone ahead and we now have a basin out back to capture the runoff of the roadways. And then this basin here as well to capture, we still have the fire access coming up. Um, and then we did have a, uh, we do have a basin out in front uh, to capture some of the additional flows. Uh, feel free to jump in with any questions that you may have as we go through it. There's, and I know it has been a long time, so I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of the modifications that we did. Um, we still, we meet all the drainage standards and for the Mass DEP, we've provided the revised um, drainage report. So uh, Woodward and Kern has reviewed that. There's no, we've, again, we've addressed um, all of their concerns. Um, again, there's, you know, we just modified utility layouts and then we did provide, uh, additional profiles that in this right here is showing the, the directional drilling that will be taking place. Uh, that's why the, in the profile, it does, uh, drop down so that we can 
go through this crossing as directional drilling for the utilities. Um, and then here's a really good view of it, that this is coming down, we're going underneath. It, it just allows to not have insulation uh, on the crossing for any of the, um, the utilities. So um, it prevents really anything that, uh, any potential for freezing, we don't have to worry about heating any of the drainage or any of the sewer uh, to ensure that it doesn't freeze up in the winter time. Uh, and we've also incorporated some of the floodplain information that they that uh, the conservation was looking for, um, and then for the compensation for that, uh, we are still in the process of working with Water and Curing to give them uh, all of the information that they need to do the final review for uh, the the floodplain, uh, but uh, and that should be wrapped up fairly soon. And this is our uh, our phasing plan that you guys were looking for. Uh, which just kind of shows that we're going to be doing the east side first and then branching over uh, and then going out and uh, working on the western side uh, as we progress with the construction. And then there was uh, the, the solar orientation plan that you were looking for as well. So there's a couple things that I think that uh, as the, the um, the letter that came out from uh, Stephanie at the end of last week, uh, we do have a list of waivers on the plans. We can go ahead and provide the list of waivers uh, in a Word document as well so that we make sure that we cover everything. Um, there was a question about the mail, where the mail was going to be delivering. We'll be um, issuing so the, all the mail will be put in the common building uh, and then we, we, we will be requesting a waiver for the EIR. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues that we're currently looking at is we're trying to um, come up with an alternative look of how we can adjust the grading and on the site to reduce the amount of fill. Um, we are in the process of doing that. We haven't finalized that, but the intent is to, to lower the site some so we can reduce the amount of fill that's coming in. Uh, and that will have an impact on the retaining wall drawings. So once that is finalized, we're going to issue, um, we'll have some lowered grades along the site and then also some lowered retaining walls. John, is that going to impact your drainage calculations and design at all? Um, where we are now, no. The majority of the um, the the drainage is going to remain the same. Um, we had built in some uh, elevations for uh, walkouts for some of the houses. Some of those are going to be removed. So it's just a um, just kind of a modification of of how the 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 area or how the units interact with the the existing grade um and i know it's for example the the clubhouse i believe we're looking at lowering a little bit so that uh we don't have nearly as you know we're not bringing in as much fill on that and then that will kind of carry through the site so there may be some uh drainage modifications um but we'll keep those to a minimum uh, I have a question. Wasn't the filling one of the uh, the things we were going to do to alleviate the concerns for contamination on this side? Yes, and and, and that we're not we're not um, adjusting the foundation so much that they're going to be into like going into the existing grade. We're um, we're setting it up so that the where we had raised the site so that we can have a full eight feet of walkout from ba the basement floor to the um, to the first floor elevation, so you have a full ceiling. Um, that the, the 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 amount of fill between the basement elevation and the uh, first floor was increased so that we could have a full walkout. So as opposed to having 
uh, you know, a dog house with a, you know, a half staircase coming up um, to the grade, we had set it up so that we were going to have um, the, 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 the basement floor at the back of the house and then yeah. eight to 10 feet to the front. And we're just, yeah. we're modifying it from there. So there's no bulkheads. Yeah. Um, uh, architectural will have to confirm that, but yeah, no, the, um, so that they make sure they have their proper e uh, egress. Um, but the, 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 the actual, where we're reducing the fill is we're just, in essence, we're trying to l eliminate walkouts so that we don't have that, you know, two feet of additional fill that we needed to compensate for the, the floor elevation differences. Okay, so Jonathan, if I could jump in here, um, I'm just wondering, so I see, best I can tell, we're down to 44 units, yes. correct? And I see the major changes since we last met is on the western side, you're almost a short shared or twin driveways, but I think that helps with the, with the aesthetic. I'm just trying to, and it looks like, um, for some reason, I was not able to access this set of plans, but uh, the public uh, parking and access to the green space uh, did make its way back in. Correct? Question? Uh, yes, in the, the, yeah, so in the- yeah, right there, right Yeah, here. right there. Right. The, the, right yeah, the there. Instead of this being a cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. it's now a hammerhead uh, with some additional parking out there. And I was just wondering on the eastern side, you, when you were going through some of the early drawings, the the six uh, interior lots, I'll call them, the ones that are sort of surrounded, um, that looked like there was other like was that some some subsurface drainage or what? There was yes. Like so there 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 is subsurface drainage um, for the six internal uh, the internal lots. So is that going to require an easement? How, like how is it? Does that wipe out any backyard usage? Uh, it'll be. It, it'll. We can go ahead and yeah, there will be a drainage easement that will need to be done for that. Um, and if that's not the case, we can look at potentially um, segmenting these a little bit. And if that's to eliminate the easement issue, we can look at segmenting them with some so that we can. Um, put individual units capturing the roof runoff on each site as well. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not anti-easement. I just, with such small lots to begin with, you'd like to, you know, obviously maybe put some thought into where it goes so that, um, you know, I mean, just looking at this, I don't know if it would matter. Uh, what, what's the dimension on those? Maybe 10 feet across or so? Eight feet? The, uh, the unit- the, the structures? Yeah, it, they're going to be, uh, <clears throat> so it's roughly um, 12, 11 feet wide by 85 and a half. And that's subsurface. Gotcha. Okay. And so I'm just curious, I know I spoke with the chair of CONCOM, uh, gave me a call last week. And I'm just wondering, um, where where you guys stand in terms of uh, getting wrapped up? Do you foresee any more substantial changes? You know, other than maybe the grading you were just talking about to eliminate some fill, or are, are they comfortable with this? Do you think, or um, are we going to get approved anytime soon so we can? We're on the agenda for the next yeah. hearing that they they requested some additional information, which we're providing. Um, as far as I'm aware there, they seem to be comfortable with the route that we're going down. We don't anticipate any major changes, um, but I don't want to speak for- Right, no, I, I know you can't, right, I understand. Um, I just didn't know if any, have you met, you've had one meeting with them since the, the, the FEMA issue or has it been two, I'm trying to think. Did you meet with them this week? They met with them last, last week, I believe. Last week. Okay. The, at the last year. Um, all right, Stephanie, do you have anything? Um, let me ju just a few things. Um, on landscape and lighting plans, the landscape plans were not provided. They provided landscaping information and plant material for the wetland replication areas, but um, there was no uh, project-wide landscaping provided. They did provide, um, they, 
The location of street lights are shown on the plans, but there's no light details or a photometric plan that's been provided. On um, the lot layout and architectural design on renderings for house designs A, A2, B, and C have been submitted and plan sheets 12 and 13 show the location of the home. So let's see, with the designated letter A, B, C, or D, um, the lettering designation of the houses on the plan needs to match up with the lettering designation of the house designs. So you can't really look at it and, and know which um, designs are going with which plans. Let's see. And then elevations are incomplete. They have in floor plans. They've only been submitted for design A2. And let's see. Landscaping, um, I mentioned that. Jonathan um, talked about the floodplain boundary and that they're still working on that and believe that they can get the information that Wooded and Curran is going to need to be able to finalize their review. Then you talked about grading, Jonathan, and number nine in my report talks about a retaining wall and a component of the drainage system that are proposed right in and um, relatively close to the property line, which actually uh, butts conservation land. And I, I believe you should provide detailed construction plans to show how this work will be conducted so it doesn't intrude into the abutting land. But is that one of the areas that's going to benefit from the reduction in fill? Which and, uh, which uh, retaining wall are you the looking? The cul-de-sac where you see the cul-de-sac and the the two. Yes. Down yeah. in this area. Yes. You can see the proximity to the. Um, it's pretty much on at that corner point, the property line. I mean, I know it's not exactly on, but it's very very close. Um, yeah. So there, there's a retaining wall out here, and then this is drainage under subsurface stuff. Um, anything that we're going through and uh, adjusting, you know, th that's one of the things we're going to go through and um, address any of the retaining walls and make sure we can lower them as much as we are able to. Yeah. And, and again, because that even the drainage and those components are all pretty close to the property line, um, we'll need to make sure that that can be completed without breaching the limit of work. Um, let's see. Um, one other thing, Greg, that I, I um, the planning board may want to weigh in on is that there, the open space that is going to be designated as part of this project, um, what the ownership is going to be or the level of protection. Um, you know, it can be a conservation restriction, it could be um, a conveyance of fee, and I, I see Walter's on the line, I don't know if he wants to weigh in on this, but at some point that needs to be determined um, before the decisions are issued, just so we know what the course of action is going to be there. And there's also some question, I was talking with Andrea Langhauser as to exactly what that open space is going to comprise. Jonathan, if you could move to the westerly portion for a minute. And I don't know if you have the plan sheet that shows all the open space areas. I believe that upper, so you have this area to the west that I believe is one of the open space parcels. The area that's yeah, if you could just point out the yeah, open. Yeah, it's the same plan set. So I'm just trying to see what we, yep. uh, this is probably the easier, the view since it's, uh, it shows the whole parcel. Yeah. So anything that's in essence, um, that is not the drainage basins uh, or the access roads is going, to, is pretty much open space. So this, uh, it it's all contiguous coming around this parcel for them. And then there's another section here 
and then also uh, the, the, you know, we would have to look at, you know, the putting the clubhouse on a single lot. I don't believe that's shown on a property. Um, and then this is all kind of open space as well. So. Um, and the intent is that the drain, the drainage components, the stormwater management components are not to be part of the open space parcels. Yeah. Correct. I believe so. So you, you know, you have large areas of open space along this area. And then the, all of this down in here is existing conservation property Yep. as well. Um, and then, so this, you know, in essence, it would all be contiguous, you know, with the conservation land, as long as you're south of the, uh, the roadway. Okay. And I think I noted this in one of my, uh, in my report, but um, it has always been, I believe, the understanding of the town that there will be a path that connects to the town's open space that will be developed as part of the project. And, and Greg, you know, you can weigh in if that's a misunderstanding. No, that was there at the right. That was, and then it was um, in jeopardy uh, with a, another commission, and um, I believe that was um, rectified. I, I can't that's, speak. That's that. my understanding from Greg. What was that? A trail to go through? Well, just yeah, the, to the south of this, the the property that one of the reasons uh, Amas going back even predating the master plan, uh, this piece of property, you know, Easton, we always uh, take pride in our 4,000 plus acres of open space. And this parcel abuts or has very close proximity, uh, close access to um, sort of what a few folks call Easton's Emerald Necklace and it ties into the Bay Colony Trail. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, it goes all the way up to the, the you know, the Cranberry Bogs up on, on Bay Road, that neck of the woods. Um, and um, and then across with the ponds across the street. So there's uh, old some few several cart paths. I think probably for lack of a better name um, south of here. And there had uh, orig originally, if you don't know if you remember, one of the very first designs. There was actually a, a road um, or a, a path, I should say, that was going to be part of the project connecting these two halves uh, through the town property. But that turned out that turned uh, to be rather troublesome. So. Um, but one of the reasons we have that public access uh, that Dale had uh, chimed in about earlier uh, is to, to have parking uh, and availability to, to the townspeople to access the green space. One of the things, you know, many folks in town don't know about all the green space we have. So we, here's a great opportunity to put in some, you know, interpretive signage and parking area and, and both walkable, drivable and bikeable access. Um, and right to, to tie there's, so there's a sort of, uh, network of, of infobal trails out there. So that's what Stephanie's referring to. They've been talking about accessing those. Yeah, we just need to, there's a few things we have to tighten up here. There's the, the, the mitigation out front with the, you know, the engineering and the installation of the lights and a few other items. So. Mr. Chairman, you mind if I jump in here for a second? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, ahead. thank you. Um, I think, so when, when we originally proposed this project, what was proposed, and, and you just summarized it um, pretty well, was public access over the road, which is a private road, so it will be done by an easement, um, to some parking spaces that the public would have the right to park in, exit their vehicles, and then a path across the open space to connect to the town owned land. Um, as you just explained, those were, those parking spaces through part of the process were suggested maybe that they be removed, but they're, they're certainly back in. And quite frankly, they're probably back in thanks to your fighting for them to be back in. 
Um, Literally fighting. <laughs> yes, I think that's probably right. <laughs> um, but recently it was brought to our attention that folks um, in town through the environmental planner, um, maybe it was commission members in the environmental planner, had some concerns, and Stephanie just touched on it, with the open space. And my understanding, and I had a very lengthy conversation with Andrea last week about this, and this is why I wanted to jump in here, um, was that the concerns were threefold. One, restricting the open space so that it's never, nothing ever happens to it other than what's approved. Two, um, creating public access to the open space. And that component is new to me. I never heard anybody mention public access to the open space. Um, and three, the concern based upon past experience in town that homeowners don't understand where their back property line is and often do things across the property line onto open space as though the property is theirs. So what was talked about was a way to demarcate these back property lines um, and then restrict the use of the open space and provide public access. So one of the suggestions was a conservation restriction. Um, as Stephanie points out in her letter, I, I pushed back a little on that. The conservation restriction is a process. Um, it, it's, it's a pain in the neck, quite frankly, to be technical about it. And um, I think that you'd be successful in getting a conservation restriction approved through the state here, excuse me, except for the piece where the clubhouse is, but I also think it's unnecessary. So I was suggesting that the planning board special permit, um, coupled with the zoning bylaw the and the wetlands regulations, both local and state, restricts the use of the land so that nothing can happen with that land without coming back and seeking approvals. Um, Andrea was not necessarily, not that she didn't believe that to be true, she just didn't think that was sufficient. So what I suggested that we do is take a look at this and create some sort of hybrid approach. And if the town wants and feels strongly about having public access to a large portion of this open space, then I said, why don't we just give the land to the Conservation Commission? Why don't we just when the project is done, deed and fee, those areas of the land that are bought the land that the town already owns. Now, in order to do that, we have to go through and carve it up a little bit differently than what's shown on the plans now, because what's shown on the plans now, um, that large tract of land, I think it's parcel C, it's the piece on the western portion, and then the piece between the western and the eastern portion, um, contains things like detention basins. And as Stephanie pointed out earlier, the town doesn't want to own our detention basins. So we'll have to carve it up a little bit differently. And then the other two pieces, what I'm proposing, and we're going to formally propose this. It's just hasn't, it's close to being done. The clubhouse piece, um, the town doesn't want to own that because the clubhouse sits on it. And there's also a detention basin out there, I believe, but there's also amenities so I would propose that that piece be deeded to the Homeowners Association and be restricted in terms of what can occur out there just by the terms of the special permit. Given the proximity of that piece to, or the lack of proximity to town-owned land, I don't see any need for public access to that piece of land. Um, you certainly don't want public accessing the clubhouse and the amenities that are just for these homeowners. And then the third piece is the piece on the furthest eastern side um, that's a little sort of rectangular piece of land, almost a square. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's got the wetland right in the middle of it. And again, that does not abut any um, town-owned land. It, um, it is sort of behind a bunch of the houses there. So my thought is you, you deed that one to the Homeowners Association as well. 
So that's that's the conversations that I've recently had with Andrea. Um, we are going to formally propose that to the commission in a response letter um, or a, a letter in response to the agent's um, comments to the project and where she raised that issue. And obviously it needs to be proposed and you guys need to agree with it as well. So I'm, I'm sort of laying the groundwork for that with this, this conversation. Um, what we submit to the commission obviously will get submitted to you as well and um, get Stephanie's feedback on it and get the board's feedback on it. But that's, that's my thought. And I had a long conversation with Rick Lincoln uh, last Friday um, and I had a long conversation with the people that are doing the wetlands presentation to the commission. Um, and they're, Rick's fine with it. And um, Mike Tuhill, who's doing the work for Conoco on the, um, on the CONCOM side, you know, is, is going to put it in writing and is, is comfortable with the proposal as well. Obviously subject to feedback from you guys. Well, well, thanks. That that's helpful info. Yeah, I had always assumed, you know, it, as the board members know, if you look in our bylaw, it, it gives us there's a you know multiple ways to, to deal with the open space. I think the way Walter laid out is sensical, and I would say this, you know, Stephanie, obviously you're, you're here, and anybody else, you know, and and Dale, I, Dale Carister, I see you chiming in, and you're we have we have promised uh, public access to the space from from day one, and and we'll continue. I think we need to and and past members of the conservation commission uh, and other members of board this is always going back three or four years looking at this property it was always uh intended to you know access that that emerald necklace if you will and that was a term coined by conservation members um not not yours truly so and right, i think it makes sense as we do with other parcels in town to have it i always assumed it would go to the conservation commission but i think we need to make sure that in our our decision and our discussions ahead of time before we wrap this thing up that it's understood by all parties um, that the, the you know the reason for the parking spaces and and the access down there is is for access and that's been desired and promised to the community and we need to make sure that that doesn't get bogged down in uh, bureaucracy for, for lack of a better word um, so Stephanie if you just can can help me that help me with that when the time comes. We'll figure out what, you know how we need Definitely to do that. Will. Yeah. Oh. Um, so Dale, I we I agree with your. Uh, there there will be public access. I we see that. Uh, I mean, so I just answered all your questions. So I'm gonna get rid of those. Um, so, uh, Walter, do you have anything else on that? Or are you all no, saying? that's it. Unless you have any questions for me, that's it. And we'll, no, like I, I said, I, we'll I, formally I, propose that. Yeah, no, I, I think that's wise. I think you laid that out um, as what what makes sense. Um, so, do we have any uh, board members um, with any other questions? Well, I just very very quick follow up. I mean, what? And maybe we're maybe you're still working on this, but what is the what is the proposed public access? Because candidly, and I, I may have missed this at one of the prior meetings, I, I thought that one of the primary, um, I don't know, we'll call it public benefits, was going to be that that little path between the, the east and the west. And I, I think I just altogether missed when that was removed or why that was removed. So what are, are there other already existing paths back there that, you know, this this is going to grant additional access to. That's, I guess, the first most important question. And then the second is maybe maybe someone can fill me in as to why the kind of the the path that was contemplated between the east and the west was was removed. Um, can I can I take this one, or Stephanie, do you want? It? Uh, you can take it. Okay. Well, I'll start. So so uh, Bob. So originally there was right there was a. At one point, they were hoping to actually connect these two with a sort of private road. That's what I, yeah, that's what I thought. And and what happened was, so if you see, could have right in the middle on the southern end, that property line, that that um, that that's town -owned, town owned land south of this, and it became uh, problem problematic, if not impossible, to. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was going to take an act of the legislature. It you know, does. It's three a three uh, pronged approval or. Um, 
vote. Yeah, so it became really difficult. And, and so that's why the road went up, went up to the north. And so down, you know, we have the, there was five or six uh, parking spaces or four. Uh, um, and if you look back at earlier engineering plans and they're still there, looking at that town, town um, owned piece, there are remnants of paths um, and which tie into you know, what, what I had mentioned previously. And so then word came up, I'll be candid, word came out uh, to the chair of your committee um, several weeks back that uh, <clears throat> that Conservation Commission was hoping to, was looking to eliminate that. And I, um, again, this, this goes back three or four years of multiple public presentations where, where not just the residents of South Street, but residents of Easton uh, and the public in general was told there'd be access to all of, one of the big things coming out of the master plan was access to, to our um, open space. Of course, there, there are, it's protected and there, there's rules uh, that have to be adhered to, but um, you know, there's, there's a, a parcel right behind me. Um, and, you know, that of course there's buffer zones and, and, uh, and, and wetlands resources. Um, that's frankly, that's why most of it's open space. But, um, you know, so it sounds like we need, you know, we, what we need to do is just make sure in our decision that uh, we, everything needs to dovetail what, what attorney Marioni uh, had spelled out. I think we probably still need to get a, 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 an understanding with uh, the conservation department um, so that when we do transfer this over the, the access that has been promised by, it's been promised by selectmen, it's been promised by multiple board members uh, um, you know, through the years, it needs to happen. It's important. It's always been one of the, you know, Stephanie, you, you'll know, you and I have been meeting on this parcel, it seems for four or five, five years, and this has always been one of the sort yeah. of uh, cornerstone, right? You know, parts of it. It was always there from the, from the get-go. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that was helpful, Greg. Thank you. Um, do you want to, anybody want to add anything to that? I, I have a question. It might be for Stephanie. I'm looking at my notes, as it was mentioned, it has been a long time since we visited this. But my note says that the peer review have some discrepancies. And I don't know if I'll, all those discrepancies have been resolved. So the stormwater review, um, and Jonathan said that they're all set on the stormwater review. I, again, I was talking with Stephanie Kaiser at Wooded and Curran on Friday. And my understanding was they were just finishing up the report. They had been waiting for some additional information. And I, I have not seen that report yet. Usually um, we review it before it's issued to the applicant. So I, Jonathan, if you could kind of respond to that. And thank you, Amos, for bringing that up because I meant to ask about that. Um, well, the discrepancies besides the uh, uh, water and, and drainage issue, there were discrepancies related to uh, the way it was checked for contamination. There were, there were a few few lines there that were uh, open at the time. And, and again, I, I apologize because maybe I have missed some meeting or whatever, so but. My, my understanding, and I've read the reports is, uh, First, when the applicant first, um, I, th I think it was at the, the pre-application meeting, because I think the formal submission came in during the period I was gone, but um, so I, I believe it was the pre-application meeting that the applicant came in and shared their test results um, showing where they had conducted. And I think I'm answering your question, Amos. If I'm not, let me know. Yeah, one of the discrepancies, they say you need to test more locations. Well, that was, um, that was raised by a resident who, who felt there had been discrepancies. And so the Conservation Commission had requested that they do some additional test pits in different areas and they did and they produced a report that was reviewed and um, essentially said that the site is clean. And I think that comes back to, and Amos, you were mentioning earlier, um, asking about the fill and contamination. I mean, one of the points that Mr. Lincoln made early on was that the um, th this is not the, I'm gonna call it virgin soil, but not the original soil that, and, and Jonathan, you can weigh in, but I've looked at the grades across the site that even reducing some of the grades 
bill that they were proposing previously that the original surface that um, was left after the demolition of the foundry has been covered with fill material. So I, I think we should all feel comfortable that the, um, you know, that the site is suitable for development and that there is not potential hazardous contamination out there. Jonathan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I, I am far and away not an expert um, on the dirty dirt portion of this, but there, there has been uh, an LSP that reviewed the site and did. Uh, there was mitigation. Um, again, this is well prior to the beginning of this design. Um, and there was a, uh, the last comment letter that Woodard and Kern provided, they had a single comment uh, regarding the LSP, which, um, and this portion of the, the concern, uh, which we responded and they responded to in, uh, uh, with a recommendation. So there, to, to my knowledge, there's no issues with the soils. Um, the intent is to, um, we have, there's a lot of fill coming into this site and, uh, you know, all of the, the, the footings and everything are going to be, you know, at grade to be, uh, you know, at existing grade and, and, you know, any minimal scraping of whatever to get rid of any of the organics, you know, the whole Eastern side is already a disturbed site. So it's not like there's, you know, virgin, uh, material that we're going into. So um, the environmental portion of the site was reviewed by an LSP uh, and then, you know, paperwork was submitted to, I believe, both the town and, and Woodard and Kern uh, clarifying any of the questions uh, that came from that. Yeah, just tell me, I'm asked one of the meetings that you missed in the winter, um, there was a um, pretty in deep depth, uh, in depth uh, report on this. So uh, that information is uh, still online or you could even go back uh, on ECAT and, and watch that, uh, but echoing what Stephanie has said. Uh, yeah, those uh, reports are available and if, if you can't get to it, Amas, let me know and we'll make sure you get a copy. Yeah, I think I read the current uh, report, the peer review, and that's what I say, there were discrepancies. Okay, um, so any board members, any other questions or comments? Um, anybody in, in the audience? I don't see any hands raised. This is the time to raise. Um, and Jonathan, you're all set, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the notes I have put down is that Stephanie mentioned a photometrics plan. We're in the progress of getting an updated one, and we'll be providing that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she had her whole list of the things. I know this was more was a, a bit of an update because I don't think it makes probably need to get a little further up with with Concom before you come back so we can wrap up. Um, and, and then. Probably at the next meeting, Greg, the uh, board should go through the waivers and just um, sure. yeah. evaluate them in yeah. the responses. So. We've been off this one for a while, so yeah, might as well keep the ball rolling while well, keep it fresh. So uh, I guess the next thing is, so do we want to continue to the next meeting or do we want to continue out a bit? How do we want to handle this? I, th I think that's... I, I think personally, I think that's a little optimistic. I'm going to uh, punt to right. the recommendation, whether they think they're going to be well, how far along. I, I do I think, think they're moving in the, you know, from what I'm hearing talking with Andrea, they are moving in the right direction. And right. The, the chair told me he felt they had two or three more meetings. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to want to push this out a month just to keep it on the books and then we can always get a continuance or how, which we do. That would be my suggestion, Jonathan. I, I think that works um, because again, I know one of the outstanding comments that uh, from both yourself and Winter and Kern is some information about the retaining walls. Um, and then, you know, for us to turn it around and for them to comment on it and then have everybody 
um, happy with it. You know, a month works better than two weeks for us. So uh, just to be fair for everyone. So, you know, sure. we're not rushing yeah. to give cram details and they're not rushing to review it. So. So why don't we, why doesn't someone on the board uh, push this out for two meetings with a motion and then we can, uh, you know, if we need to continue after that, we always can. And what unless, is it? What is the date, Stephanie? Unless Suzanne pipes up otherwise, I have November it at, 9th. That was November 9th. November right. 9th, I heard, right. Motion, motion to continue November 9th. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, strange aye. Okay, the mic. Anderson, aye. Stetson, aye. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, you too. Um, okay, board members, we are two hours in and we're about to jump into our proposed zoning amendments. Does anybody need do we, any reason we need to take a five minute break? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, even in the age of Zoom. <laughs> All right, everybody. Two hours is not even. Moot, the moot their thing and let's get back <laughs> here in five minutes. Walter, are you um, are you staying on? I'm going to make you. Uh, at this moment, I'm going to return. I, I'm ju I'm jumping off right now. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everybody. You too.
Can I be heard drinking coffee? It's going to get embarrassing. Oh, we should have all come back with drinks. That would have been. He said. And I hit the Nespresso. <laughs> all right. Uh, Su Suzanne back? Correct. All right. So, oh, um, we don't have our clerk. <laughs> Who's yes. going to read the notices? I don't have the notices. Oh. Um, you want to email something? him? I have, you know what? I have yep. them online. Let's see. I think this. Suzanne is... emailed them, right? I did. Yeah, I, I have it. My Chris, Chris, read it from the screen. Sounds like you want to read it now. Um, Town of Easton, notice of public hearing in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 40A, Section 5, MGL, the Easton Planning and Zoning Board will hold a public hearing to be held remotely on Zoom Tuesday, October 13th, 2020, for the purpose of receiving public comments concerning the following amendments to the Easton Zoning Bylaw, Easton Code Book, Chapter 235 zoning to create a or one to create a new zoning district along foundry street furnace village district at section 235-51.2 and to amend the town of easton zoning map two to split appendix a into two sections appendix a1 traditional zoning districts and appendix a2 special zoning districts and to allow laundromat use within the Quisic commercial district a and to allow mixed use within the village business district. Number three, to amend appendix B, dimensional and density regulations. Copies of the zoning bylaw amendments are available for review on the Easton Planning and Zoning website. Any person interested or wishing to be heard should appear at the time and place designated for the public hearing. This notice is also available at masspubliknotices.org. Gregory Strange, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Wonderful done. So I think we are we are about to do something. I wonder if we're the first town in Massachusetts to, to amend zoning that has gone through four different town planners. <laughs> so we started this over a year ago with Stephanie. And as we know, Stephanie departed and we worked with Andrea Langhauser on an interim basis. And then we worked with Emai, who brought it into its current form. And we had just about wrapped up when wonderful COVID came along and put everything on hold. And thank you to the uh, good graces of our town administrator. We have a special town meeting, which we can actually handle some zoning. So now with Stephanie back, we've, we've come full circle. So we were just waiting for you, Stephanie. Um, and so for the board members or for folks at home, the bylaw that has been online that we have that we'll be reviewing tonight is uh, where we had left off. And not speaking for the board, even though I'm the chair, but I, I think it's safe to say we were pretty, we we're 99.9%. .9%. I think we were there pretty much. We had, um, we had, you know, memory service, we had held uh, a lot of. I think 12 public meetings on this. And we had uh, gotten it to its, we had, we had revised the map several times, we had revised all this. And, and then we finally, we all kept getting confused on some of the formatting and, and uh, Emai did a great job putting it into the, to this format. A little awkward to look at it when you list it as zoning amendments because you're not looking at the entire bylaw, but um, it, uh, so, I think, and I, I think it's important <clears throat> that we don't, you know, I, uh, we've all looked at this and we're going to talk about it tonight and we have time on our side. So I don't think we should close tonight. I think not that we, I anticipate changing anything or who knows, but um, we're change, changing anything substantially, but I think we should, you know, I don't know, let it start to percolate in us again, right? You know, it's been, we haven't looked at this since probably April, if, if not March. Um, so anyways, with that, um, Stephanie, do you, I know you were talking about the order today, so why don't you 
Um, right. So the way um, we've drafted these um, for the warrant is to um, have zoning amendment appendix A go first, and that would be the mixed use within the village business district and the laundromat allowed in the Cuisic commercial district. And the reason for doing that is just to ensure that that, that passes. Um, and then that those changes get incorporated when the zoning amendment article for appendix A1 and A2 come up. So the order is looking um, zoning amendment Appendix A, then the Furnace Village District Special Permit, then talking about the split of the use table into Appendix A1 and A2, which would, A1 would have the standard zoning, A2 would have the special district zoning, and then the um, zoning amendment for Appendix B and wrapping up that up with the zoning map. So my suggestion to um, Greg was that we take them in that order, which I think the final, the agenda I was looking at earlier today, Greg was an older agenda that didn't have them in that order, but I think that's in the order that they're on your agenda for tonight. Right, that's what I thought when I was looking at it, so. Yeah, okay. so you, you were being very gracious, not asking me if I was crazy. No, and no, I was just a little. I, was, okay. I said you were being very gracious, not. No, yeah, no, that's right. Um, okay, so. And, um, and I displayed, I, I have the articles all um, in a PDF that I can also share on screen if, if you want or feel we need to reference them at any point. You know, I'm trying to find, for some reason I can't find Appendix A here. Oh, here it is. And why don't I, I'm going to yeah, share. share screen. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So. Um, and then I have well, to get my cat out of my. Appendix A, table of A, right? That's where we're at, table of use. Yep, principal uses E9. Can you see those? Are they up? Not yet. Oh, okay. There, yep, there now. Yes, this is the this is the one that was many pages, um, two pages. And I had, I had just one. Is it's funny? I actually received uh, a couple of calls last week and over the weekend uh, regarding this, and it reminded me. I look, I went back and looked at the old notes, and if you turn to the ninth page in, uh, it's under. Let's see, under crease it. Uh, this furnace village notes um i don't have a page number here so but not if you did, if anybody's printed this up nine pages in it's it's under uh Greg, which one are you opening the one i think stephanie was referring to is only two pages appendix oh. a a by itself not the detailed split so append so the oh, way yeah, well, and can you see, am I actually scrolling because I can't. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're talking no, about the one that has principal have, uses. Um, uh, it's Windows Explorer open. Okay. I, I was afraid I didn't have that. Oops, hold on. No, I lost it. There we go. Stop share. Let me see. share my screen if it's easier. I have them all up. There we go. Can you see them now? Yes. Okay. That's the one Greg's talking about, the one you have open now, I believe. But you're talking about, you're starting with the two page one, I take yes. it, Stephanie. Yes. Okay. So yep. I, I grabbed the larger one. <clears throat> you know what it is? We don't have articles in here yet, article numbers. So it, the titles are the same on those. So. Um, so, yeah. So the first one is the laundromat. As we, we all remember, right? I think we're, we're all, yeah, we we're all on the board at the time. Uh, the reason for this. Um, yeah, you know what? Is this our... I'm sorry, while you were, I, I did okay. roll down. I'm going back up here. There yeah. we go. There you go. There we go. Okay. So, um, 
so this one, when the Cuisa Commercial District was first, uh, the, 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 the uh, bylaws were written for that seven years ago, eight years ago, um, broke into three districts and the laundromat was not allowed in uh, sub-district A up, up towards the intersection um, of 123 and 138th. And the little strip plaza that's there that has currently has a dry cleaners business in it. And it used to have a uh, store 24, no, 7-Eleven, what was it? Oh, Whatever yeah. that, that newer building. Yeah. Um, yep. a, a, <clears throat> a firm, uh, a company came in to open a laundromat there because they misinterpreted the, the bylaws or they misread the bylaws and um, they had already uh, signed their lease, uh, taken out their loans, had started to, went to get their building permit and they couldn't do it. Um, and at speaking with the interim planning director at the time uh, who, who had um, expressed that, told me what had happened, uh, spoke with the DPW director and they were all on board with wanting to get a laundromat there because it would actually would help out with the, the sewer district as that comes up to speed. O always good to have um, flow through the uh, flow through the um, system treatment treatment plant and and it doesn't hurt to to get to gain fees so uh and there's a college right there so uh, all things that make sense to have a, a have a laundromat so that was sort of the discussions that we had and that's why we voted to um you know to to uh put this on the put this on the warrant best as i recall um so any questions or comments or concerns on this one the other a uh, point that I would make is that the way this was written previously, it did not have the word laundromat. It had hand laundry, dry cleaning, or tailoring, or other similar uses. And I had actually um, done the research on this before leaving because when that when that all came up about um, someone trying to open a laundromat in the district, and every town um, had they had hand laundry in their bylaw, but they also explicitly stated laundromat. So it seemed to make sense so that people weren't confused over what, what's a hand laundry versus a laundromat. Sounds good. Yes. <laughs> Did anybody <laughs> determine what a hand laundry, a hand laundry is? Actually, I think once upon a time, you could go have your clothes hand laundered by someone. Or you, or you, you put the laundry on the machine by hand. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, well, right. It, it just, it didn't well, I suspect the advent of zoning happened after hand laundering was eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it, it would have been by the river, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah river. right. You can't wash your clothes in the river. <laughs> so as we go through these, are we going to vote on, on them one at a time? Probably should, right? Uh, why don't you do oh, I, guess I mean, some of oh, the, yeah. like, I, I think the Furnace Village will probably keep open, but some of these easy ones, if we want to vote tonight, we can. Or do you want to do it all at one omnibus one, Stephanie? What do you think? I like voting for the ones that you can and getting them out of the way. Yeah, get them out of the way, right? Okay. So, uh, board members, any questions or concerns on um, this first change to the use? Nope. Anybody in the public? I don't. I, I see Dale has a question, but that's regarding Furnace Village. So we'll get to that when we get there. Um, so, if someone would want to make a motion, and the motion would say what, Stephanie? Uh, the motion would be to vote to amend the use uh, the zoning bylaw to change the table of use regulations to allow a laundromat in the Quesit Commercial District A, B, and C. So moved. Second. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none and seeing none. All those in favor, strange aye. Okay, they might. Anderson, aye. That's an aye. <clears throat> That's unanimous, 4 0. Great. Okay. Now, and the next one is for mixed use.
in the village business district? Um, so <clears throat> I have a question and when we back, back when we were working on this, um, and this happened, this is when we were working with Andrea when Andrea was in the interim room and we got to the multi one, you know, we wanted to do, um, you know, mixed use in the village business district. And we thought, okay, how can we, we, so we looked at some of the, you know, it's a small district, the properties, you know, how many units. And at one point, so we plugged in at one point, actually, I recommended a number, you know, X units per number, you know, one unit per X square feet. And it was a very large number, you know, we, but we just kind of left it and you know, at the night, Andrew said, well, let's just leave it for now and we'll tune it when we get there. So, and I'm just trying to, so looking at, this is the, Board members, do you remember? So the planning zoning board may grant a special permit for up to four dwelling units per 2,500 square feet. I'm assuming that 2,500 square feet obviously is in lot size. Did we ever have discussions regarding that? Is everybody comfortable with that number? I, I remember the 2,500, but I don't remember how we came to that. And that, that square feet is what, footprint? Site, site, lot, lot size. Lot size. That would be that, 16, we were always talking in 10,000, I thought. Which well, I think you're thinking of, of Furnace Village was one of those. Yeah, Down, the that, village. Are much oh, smaller. right, sorry. I, I thought we were trying to just maintain I think we, I, I don't remember who it was. It was probably you, Greg, that came up with kind of the, the sizing down there. And we tried right, I did, to then at, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I did. Then after the meeting, I realized, oh, wait a minute. That's, you know, when I looked at the sizes. So why don't we, instead of taking the time now, why don't we maybe look at the lot sizes and just maybe at the next meeting talk. You, I just want to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call up. I can call up the assessor's map real quick here. But my, my concern was, we, we don't want to write something that allows, you know, uh, 29 apartments in a tiny little lot. Well, you're, you're right. And I guess, I guess the other, the other issue there is that there are a few lots down there that are quite a bit bigger than that kind of main thoroughfare thoroughfare that we were really kind of looking at. Um, right. But are they in the, I don't know if they're in the district. That's yeah. I think the district is smaller than. Um, so okay, this is the village business district, which is pretty right. small. Right, but wasn't there, didn't didn't we have, didn't, I'm trying to refresh my memory, but didn't we have this discussion when we were talking about that, that kind of that corner lot there that had the old uh, rundown, um, actually, I think it was a lawyer's office, or, or right. it may have yep. been at some, and, and isn't that, that's a pretty sizable lot. Um, <clears throat> well, it, yeah, right, because well, there's three structures on it now, right, there's a house, there's that building that's dilapidated, right. and then there's a is it, there's a duplex on Main Street. I think it's a duplex. Is that oh that's all that's part of it. okay. All right. Yeah, on the same. A, at one yeah. point in time, historically, it had been three separate lots. If you go back through some of the old maps, but now okay. it's it's kind of odd. It's one it's one lot with three buildings on it. Um, so let me. Um, so I'm just wondering. And share. I have um, my GIS up. And I think I can share my screen if you'd like me to do that. Sure, that would be great. So okay. For some reason, the assessor's map's loading really slowly. So. Share there. Did that work or we, do we still have the zoning up? Do you see a map? No, that's, a, that's the village business district, yep. Yes, okay. Um, well, yeah, we're talking about Main Street and Williams, people. right? Totally, totally aside. Oh, I'm sorry, Stephanie. I didn't mean to walk. Stephanie, what no, you that's say? Good. Go ahead. No, go ahead. For some reason, I can't load the. Um, does that give you lot sizes? I can. I can um, view lot sizes. So, for example, let's look at some of those smaller ones along here. 
Um, let's look at the wonderful empty lot right there. And I have to change this so I know what I'm looking at. So that lot is 9,400 square feet where you see my eye in the round circle, which is right across the street from the- Yeah, lot. so see just for, so that is, um, so for example, so what is that 114 main? Is that what that is? Uh, that's, yes. Okay, so for example, 114 main where the, the, the hole in the ground is next to the farmer's daughter. Yep. Um, if that, Greg? We lost you. He yeah, so that would be, I think I can answer what he was going to say. 9,400, you know, so 12, up to about six, you'd get 16 apartments or 16 units, I should say. Yeah. How, how many units are in that little sliver above um, the farmer's daughter there? I want to say three or four at the maximum. Does that sound there, right, Greg? Is that, there's one yeah, per well, lot? You know, and I remember, you know what we should probably do? You know what I think we should do? Um, I think we should, why don't we do this? Tomorrow, Stephanie and or I, because we have our weekly call, let's, we'll send out the map of the village business district with all the lot sizes. And then if you remember when we did this, I had a list I had gotten from the landlords in the area, uh, which is on this computer somewhere, but I don't want to take the time to find it right now, with, with the number of existing apartments in the buildings. Mm. And because looking at that, I'm going, okay, th this is where we're at the 2,500. It was, we threw that number out there. And I think as soon as the meeting was over, as we were walking out, I was like, oh, you know what? I think that's, I think I made a sort of a, a math mistake. But why don't we, let's send that out and then everybody can just contemplate over the next two weeks and we can wrap this up. You know, it's just a matter of finding out what we think the number is. Uh, and maybe it's the 2,500, but it's, instead of rushing it right now, I think if I can give you guys that info. And I think it's better handled at the next meeting. Sounds good. Fine okay with that? Yep, it's fine here. Um, and uh, okay, great. So do we need to vote to continue on that one? Oh, we can do that later. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, so which one's next, Stephanie? Here's my agenda. Oh, All then right. you get right to Furnace Village District. Okay, Furnace Village District. Um, so just right off the bat, I got a couple calls today or texts uh, or call and a text from some residents and asking the same question that Dale asked. And I said, many folks are concerned that allowance of Article 13 at town meeting, including the Buckley, which we call the Belcher property, but this is the same, into the sewer district will make it more likely that the Buckley property would be rezoned for greater density. Folks are very nervous about this. I just want to... so. Um, the article 13 is there's a property on South street, which is not part of the furnace village district that we're proposing. You guys remember it's the large, we actually proposed it originally, but we, we pulled it out and article 13, the current, uh, the, uh, the person who is purchasing that property would like to, uh, is going to be filing this week for a flexible development and would like to, uh, tie into the sewer. So that's why that is on um town meeting uh but as i told the folks today and i'll tell, I'll tell uh, dale carister right now um whether a property is or is not in a sewer district has no bearing on its doesn't change its zoning to change as we know changing zoning requires a myriad of public meetings public hearings uh and then if the planning board were vote to did vote to amend that um it would go to the floor of the town um uh, town meeting. Um, now, the property, um, Stephanie and I both know we, we've been uh, in communication with the, the developer who's going to be filing, like I said, for, for a flexible development. But hey, mm -hmm. anything could happen. He could change his mind, or it could not be allowed, or not approved, or, or it could change. But that by no means is, uh, that doesn't, it's not going to default to, it's, it's not part of the um, Furnace Village District. And if for any reason someone wanted to make it part of Furnace Village District, it would have to go through the same process that we've done for all these other properties. So it's not gonna, you know, and, and anybody would have, uh, would have uh, uh, multiple opportunities to, to chime in on that. So hopefully that answers uh, 
anybody's uh, question on that. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, that question was there. So I just wanted to, I, I like to zero out the question so I can see if anybody else asks a question so we don't forget. So, um, okay, so the Furnace Village District, um, I don't know how you guys want to do this or, and Stephanie, because this is first time we've been with you in, in this format. Um, mm -hmm. But the, you know, really what we're doing is we're looking at the first section that, is, that Stephanie has up, um, which is the Furnace Village District, which talks about the purpose and, and the sub districts and the site plan approval. Uh, and then, and that'll be an article. <laughs> and, then, and then another article is the dimensional and density requirements for that district. And then another article is the table of use regulations uh, in the version that if, if this passes, it would be in. And, and then of course the zoning map for the district. Um, so Stephanie, you, with you being, uh, um, well, you know, yeah, with this is being your first time with us in this format. I don't know if you have any questions for us or if you anything you want to chime no, in on I, or. I went through it and I, I had the, um, uh, as you mentioned, Imai did a great job of consolidating everything, but the first version, um, that, he, that I found had the original like regulation format and then the special permit format. Um, I, I looked through this. I think it makes sense. It follows a similar approach that we took for the Quisit, um, I mean, for the commercial, the compact neighborhood overlay district in um, the five corners where it talks about the process, kind of what the general purpose is. And then you have your uses defined in um, the use table and it's a special permit. So I, I didn't have any questions. I understood this. And I really liked the way the board was proposing breaking out the table of uses into two different tables where you had the standard um, use regulations and then you had the, oh, the um, special district uses. And I thought that made it a lot clearer. There were a lot of footnotes. I think they, people were getting lost. I would sometimes get lost in the footnotes when I was referring to it. So I thought that made a lot of sense. And I think that what you're proposing for density and um, uses makes for the intent of the district. So. Um, yeah. So. And, you know, during the, when Emai put it into this abridged form, uh, one of the sections, if, if you guys remember, a big, big chunk of this were design guidelines. And in here somewhere, there's a reference to the planning board may, if it chooses, you know, part of its rules and regs, uh, create uh, design guidelines. You know, if this uh, passes at town meeting, I think we should in fact I, i'd spoken with deb and i think we should put a either do it as a committee or put a subcommittee together i think we should um get a working group and get get those regs out um while our while our our um, dance card is not full and while it's still fresh in our mind um yeah. so just two so two little things i had looking through this again uh and one is under the zoning uh, and then I'll, then I'll just open this up to the floor and then we can go to the public but under the the, the zoning amendment the dimensional and density regulations um yeah. under the one two third table down it says dimensional and density regulation tables for specific uses and i think we just that first column the title it says zoning district i think that just should say use because if you look under it, it says apartments motel and oh, yeah. bill that is not the district. You're right. That's me channeling Peter. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, no, because see, those aren't districts. Yeah, they are. Yes. So if apartments, not a zone. Wait a minute. District. Wait a minute. Wait, uh, I'm looking right here, Greg. See, apartments where... isn't there. On that one. Um, so one, two. The next, the third table has it. Third table down. Keep going. Yeah. All right, right there. 
Oh, right here. Yes, yeah. you are correct. So see, yes. So that's yeah. just a set of zoning districts should just say use, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. No, anyway, so that's just some housekeeping. And then, so I got a uh, yes. call, like I said, I got a call over the weekend and a text uh, from a couple interested parties. And it reminded me, the one when we last looked at this back in April, the one question, one concern I had, um, so this is now under the, the large zoning amendment, Appendix A, Table of Use Regulations. And of course it's the ninth page in, it's, it's after, um, okay, you go to Appendix A2, uh, and Appendix A2 goes in one, two, so the, after the table for Appendix A2, underneath it for, for, for footnotes, it says Quisa Commercial District Notes, and then it says Furnace Village Notes. So what, I'm, what I want to discuss is the Furnace Village Notes at the bottom of a page. Page nine. Yeah. <clears throat> page nine is where I have it. Ah, there you go. Um, so, and I remember, I actually, I don't think I ever even realized this was in there until I, I discovered it this summer one time uh, after I received a, a note. And it, so it, it talks about, so if you, the number of upper story or multifamily units shall be one for 5,000 per lot, as defined, uh, with a maximum of 10 in the Depot Street subdistrict and one for 2,500 square feet and a maximum of 20 in the Eastman Street subdistrict, unless the planning and zoning board grants a special permit for additional units. So my question for that, I really have three questions or, or question. So do, are we good with that? Do we want to, do we want that there? And if we do, should we put a cap on it? I don't know, you know, uh, and, and, or what is the, what will our decision be based on? And I know we wouldn't put that in the bylaw, but I would just, is that too, are we comfortable with that or is it too open-ended? Is that gonna cause um, issues? Just kind of a looking for opinions of the board. Um, you know, this sort of dovetails into a conversation that you and I have been having publicly for a while. I'm comfortable with it. Um, I like it and I think it gives us, you know, because I think we've decided, and I've certainly made my peace with it more or less, to go with the special permit route here, I think this gives us some additional flexibility to consider the right project should it should it come along. So I like it, and I, you know, I'm glad you actually brought it up because what I was going to suggest, Greg, is if you look on the next page under um, Note Six A. I was going to suggest, uh, no, uh, stay, nope, back up. <laughs> Just next page, it's the next page. Yeah, you were already, you were already there, I, I Wait think. Wait a minute, here, or do L I? A little keep... more. Yeah, yeah go uh, up. footnote Just six. Go up. Just a little bit more. Little more, all right, next, next paragraph. Keep going. You're almost up, there. Up. Oh, oh, almost oh. There. Okay. <laughs> I was That's actually, <laughs> so, so what I was gonna propose is to add similar language there at the end of 6A. Actually, really the same language. I was going to propose that we add the same language there. And, and Greg, for what it's worth, I I agree with with um, Rob. That no, that's why I'm I'm not saying it because I'm yeah. against it. I mean, I'll, oh, I'll be yeah, honest. No, I know. Reason, you know. It does I, give the board flexibility if the right project came along. Right, and but I but I think it would help us to. I think going back to my earlier point about the the design guidelines yeah um because if we're going to allow um you know a density bonus or maybe it's not a bonus but a potential increase in density um it needs to what, what are you going to as a board what are you going to make that decision against you know what i'm saying um and i think if we have called out things that are important to us i you know like in a design guideline um then that helps us, you know, say, hey, okay, yeah, I'm in favor of this because A, B, C, D versus uh, I just like this person better, right? Which I, I think that's right. I, I mean, yeah. you know, I guess when we were initially doing this, we were kind of going to include a whole bunch of stuff in 
the um, in the bylaw, but I, I, I agree with you. I actually think it does make perhaps even more sense to do it in the rules and regs. And, um, you know, I think we've already at least laid, I mean, I feel as though we've, we've laid the groundwork a little bit to be able to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think if we roll up our sleeves, we, we should, we should probably get that done in conjunction with this, with this uh, project. Yeah, no, I agree. Cause, and like you say, um, then, you know, businesses, developers, homeowners, people want predictability. Um, so, uh, and, and again, and I, and I think it helps you as a board. Sometimes it's not easy to say no, that, not that you want to say no, but you're like, oh, I just don't think this is, now you can say, well, wait a minute, we will, here's some of the things we want and you haven't hit any of them or, or vice versa. Yeah, look, wow, look at, you've done all of these. You've come up with this great presentation. You've put the money in to, to show that you're, you know, you know, and yeah, we're, we're confident in allowing this. Um, so just real quick, hey, a little question for the board. It's funny that you bring up 6A, Bob. So I had this mark too. The maximum number of dwelling units permitted in the district. Isn't, isn't that dangerous? Because couldn't someone say, like, we, we know we're talking about the district. So that should be out of there, right? Because that kind of almost looks at it dis district-wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I know it's yeah a good a lawyer harder, might just thought, a good lawyer not... might point that out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you never know, right? I mean, just what? Well, well, I, I, I agree that could be cleaned up a little bit. You're right. right. So, Stephanie, did you follow that? Yeah, you want me to strike in the district? I just don't think we need that. Yeah, because I, I think, think it. It's I mean, redundant. You're right, and it, it just could be dangerous. Up. Could just be dangerous. Yeah. It's um, really the maximum num number of dwelling units shall be no more. I mean, that's exactly, that's really exactly. you get rid of permitted too. Yes, but yeah. I, I would add that unless language from um, from two, and then I I think I think we've gone a long way to resolve some of the the issues that I had previously raised, and um, I'm comfortable with it. I'd, I'd even be comfortable voting on it tonight. Rob, which, in the Furnace Village notes too, which language is it, or is it was it the three? The Planning and Zoning Board may grant a special permit for greater. If you go, can you go back up to two and I'll, okay, I'll get you the exact true. language? Yeah. Yes. What, 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 what do you want, bring bring two to 6A or keep both? Um, what, so what I'm proposing is that last clause, the unless clause, everything after that. So unless oh, the yeah. planning and zoning board grants a special permit for additional units. Okay. Yes, okay. I, I think I'm not only comfortable with that, I'm latching in what Greg said before. I think this gives the people that wants to develop a little more predictability about what they can expect for approval and or not, if they are coming with something that doesn't meet this, they will need to explain. So I, I, I think this is good, not, not just for the board, it's good for the people that will need to latch in order to develop this area. Um, so one, there's a couple couple questions <clears throat> out here. Um, first from anonymous attendee, <laughs> what do the developers plan on building? Um, we don't, you know, this, this zoning allows uh, uh, several different types of building and, you know, um, I don't know what developers are talking about there, but there's nothing uh, proposed in this district yet as it doesn't exist, but um, you know, there, there are multiple uh, uses uh, as pointed out in the use tables that can be, uh, that, that are allowed in the district. So hopefully that answers that. Uh, and then Kathy Walsh, <clears throat> 7 South Street asks, much has changed in the past year. Can you remind me why we want to change the residential density to 15,000 square feet at this time. I'm concerned about setting a precedent for residential lot size in Easton. Um, anybody want to take that? Am I taking it? Um, so I would say, first of all, um, and Stephanie, feel, feel free to chime in here with me. I don't want to uh, make this a one person show. The, but setting precedent, you know, the zoning amendments, it's, 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 it isn't precedent. Any, anytime we look to change zoning, it, we go through a, a series of public meetings and hearings and neighborhood meetings privately and publicly. And 
talking to folks and a, a lot of this going back to the master plan uh we it came out that we one of the main things we needed in easton was diversified housing um and you know back at the time i know i, I know people have heard me say this ad nauseum but you know your, your option many times was just a you know a either a large you know a large bill you know a, a new house that was not afforded not able to be afforded by um a lot of folks in town or or rental or you could buy an old house that needed a bunch of work um we're looking to create houses for empty nesters you know for young families um there's a trend towards smaller homes the 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 days of the there's not much land left in easton so we're looking for ways that we can you know newer families in this in this decade and decades going you know are, are they're not looking for four thousand square foot homes that much they, they want smaller homes um so, and we're looking to create walkable neighborhoods for our three main neighborhoods in town. And the Furnace Village, the whole game plan here by bringing the sewer in, that will bring economic development to the property owners. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and stimulus and that, you know, with uh, the project going on at the foundry, uh, creating a, a neighbor, a compact neighborhood of small homes, which also are gonna be through mitigation, bringing a light, uh, traffic light much needed to that area. And, uh, monies towards uh, engineering, um, you know, a revamping of the 106 corridor, hopefully in the next decade to, to make it walkable and bring in, you know, bring in sidewalks and bring in, uh, sh you know, shade trees, benches and other amenities. Uh, and to really reinvent, you know, bricks and mortar are changing to reinvent uh, the, the downtown five corners from Furnace Village area. Mm -hmm. um, and by allowing uh, a smaller lot size, and there are a number of small lots in this area, but by allowing that will will allow um, a small number of properties to, to possibly increase, um, you know, add, add a few dwelling units, um, smaller homes to, to add to the walkability of, of the neighborhood. So that, that's the, as best I can say, uh, that's that's sort of the, the thought and the reasoning behind it. I don't, I don't know if Stephanie or anybody on the board wants to Wants I, to add to that, feel free. I covered it. I would just add that during when we were working on the diff district and we held the the charrette visioning for the five corners, that, that that's what we heard from the majority of people who participated, that they wanted to see this as a walkable, connected neighborhood where you could um, avail yourselves of certain amenities and services. Um, there was a potential for work opportunities in the district and um, that you could easily access the um, open space areas. And we're talking about adding connections through sawmill to the open space areas. And if you think about it, I was, I don't remember who I was saying this to the other day, but if you think about it um, from Depot Street to Robert Drive and where Foundry turns to the South is one mile. But today, if you think about walking that area, I, I, I bet most of you would imagine that it's a lot longer than one mile because that walkability just isn't inviting. Um, so um, to echo what Greg said and, and just add that. I, I, I understood the question totally differently, not about justifying what we are doing with this area and this new districting, but actually the question, as I understood it is, will this spread to other areas on the future? And, and I will say the following on that. No, unless someone amend the bylaws again, and that will be the process. And if this is good in this area and the process in the future and the people that are participating in that process, uh, will agree that another area in town needs this type of development, uh, I will say be it. That, that is the way we manage uh, and plan the, the zoning and the district. That's the way I understood the question from coming from this person. Yeah, it, it was a two part question and, and maybe I passed over too quickly. But what I, she said she was concerned that this would start a precedent. And all right, to your point, Anytime we change zoning in town um, or, or attempt to change zoning in town, propose to change it, we go through a vigorous public process. 
Um, so, and, and that includes, you know, as the, as this neighborhood knows, we we've, we've communicated many many times with them, both Stephanie and myself, and this board, and met with them. And um, so, you know, there's no, we you know, we have flexible development in town, which it, it looks to to create smaller lots to, to create more open space um, and and protect resources for the town. Uh, we've have you know, we're looking for compact neighborhoods in some areas and we still do conventional subdivisions as well but there's not much land left in Eason um, and we're just looking for creative ways that we can create um, diversified housing types for all the reasons we, we touched on so um, so uh, Greg, um, Greg yeah. on, on these bylaws and I am now looking at the were walkable. Uh, I don't know that we have, there is some things that talk about sidewalks and uh, uh, crossings on, on the roads and things of the sort that are very important. If you want to walk that mile that Stephanie is talking about is dangerous today. You can actually, you cannot walk there on the, on the road uh, that easily. Uh, so, if we are intending to to have a walkable uh, neighborhood, we we need to maybe get on the design uh, regulations and rules a little more deeper into uh, mm -hmm. sidewalks and uh, crossings and all that kind of details. Sure. Well, well, keep in mind that this the majority of this district, or all of this district, right, is on, well, most of, 90% of this district is on Route 123 and 106. Right. And what I said earlier, you know, so it's handled a little differently than if it was a, a town town road. A state, there's a different state process. Uh, but to your point, in the, when if you looked at the rules and regs, uh, I'm sorry, if you looked at the design guidelines uh, that Judy Barrett had started with this and that we had tweaked, and we'll incorporate uh, at least some some part into our design guidelines. Um, there is, you know, talk of of sidewalks and crosswalks, and it, it addresses the human scale. And I think a really important part of this again goes back to the mitigation on the on the foundry part on sawmill project, where there'll be monies um, going towards uh, the the design of this, the redesign of 106, um, and that's. And you know Stephanie and, and or Dave Fields can speak much much more educated on that than I. But there's a there's a whole long process that goes through the state. But those talks have been you know had uh, in town hall. I've been able to sit in on them and and or you know we want to get the ball rolling um, with the monies from that project. Um, so board so. I guess two questions. Do board members do we have any more questions or comments on this? And and you know, Bob, to your point, I know you said you're you're comfortable with voting tonight, and you know, as am I. But I'm just wondering where we're not, we don't have it under the guns. First time we've looked at it. Not that we're going to change it, but you know, Deb and Peter aren't here, and I I'd, I'd hate to you know where if if if, it, if this was time sensitive and we had to get it done tonight, but I'd, I'd hate to eliminate them just from having any you know chance to chime in one one last uh time if uh, the, the, that's a good point i yeah i agree yeah and then that way you step we can definitely can make the couple edits that we have from tonight we can and plus we still have to look at that village business thing anyways right yeah that's, that's true that's different that's different but but definitely i think at the next meeting we could we could vote um all right so there's a question from Jennifer, and Jennifer, forgive me if I'm terrible with names, but Carol, maybe? Um, 19 Lancelot Lane, I'm just tuning in. My concern is that the South Street builders are going to ask for extensions on my boarding property. I want to know how to decline any petitions. Um, I don't, I, I don't see that. As I'm assuming that extensions on my bordering property is maybe what that means well, but I, I think is what she means but does uh does <coughs> jennifer are you talking about oh sorry bordering i i don't think the pro i think the project's going to be completely contained 
within. Yeah, I mean, there, there's access off of South Street. Right, um, right. That's at least that's the current plan and thought. And, and again, we have J Jennifer. Just so you know, we have not seen um, the plan yet. I mean, we've seen some preliminaries, but the the application hasn't come in yet. It should be coming in this week. Um, and then there'll be a whole public process. So, any, but but there, the subdivision will be or the flexible development will be constructed if approved on that home on that property owner's property, not not. Outside of it, so. I mean, I and and I think this is not a it's not a public project. So I mean, certainly a developer could ask you um, if you were willing, if they wanted to expand the project, they could certainly ask you um, if you were willing to part with your land, certainly for a price. But this isn't. Um, but we've heard no. It's not going to happen. We have, we've right. heard nothing of that. They so. can't. In fact, mm -hmm. most of this property is surrounded, most of the proposed development is surrounded with, with open space, so. Right, uh, right. Uh, okay, board members, anything else to add on, on this? And then, the, you know, we have the map too, I guess just take one last look, but we're, yep. you know, that, that's, we certainly revised that a few times. <laughs> um, and um, so, do we vote? So we would just vote to continue this, I guess, right? Yes. Um, anybody before we continue this, if there's anybody else online that wants to chime in, please wave now. Um, otherwise, if a board, a board, if you guys are all set, if you want to make a motion to continue to our next meeting. Motion to continue our next meeting. Second. Uh, any further discussion, hearing and seeing none, all those in favor, strange eye. Anderson, aye. Yeah, my... That's an eye. Great, unanimous, thank you. And thank you everybody that uh, hung on at, online. I know it was a long night, we appreciate it. And we will be discussing this uh, and probably wrapping this up at our next meeting on October 26th. All right, um, meeting minutes. Oh, wait, we have a ZBA request for comment. Sorry, I forgot all about that. Um, 290 Turnpike Street. Let me call up my agenda here. So, Stephanie. Oh, this was the. Uh, this is the one. Okay. Yeah. When you and I discussed it. Yep. All right. I'll let you. You want to take the floor and give these guys. Okay. The so this one. this property was um, came before the board. Gosh, I want to say two years ago. And, and in fact, I think it was before some of the members' time, and it was approved for contractor bays. And what the, my understanding is during the period that I was gone, they came back and requested from um, the Zoning Board of Appeals a use variance to allow a, um, a play, uh, like a sports um, training center. And now they're coming back and asking if they can convert another bay or use another of the bays as a fitness center. This was the batting cage. Remember the building with the batting cages we did a couple of months ago? This is that yeah. same. Yeah, yeah so this, it, this is with the parking and all that. There was a lot of discussion right. on the parking. Yeah. On this one, is is it that they're um, they're not gonna use the entire space of the batting cages or no, if you look at um right, yeah, there's a plan it's pages it's, oh here it is shows okay. two of the units. All right. Got it. So I guess the because this is a change of use, right? So that, that's why it's going for a variance, right? Is right. Yeah. Okay. It's a special permit, Suzanne. Correct. Oh, right, because it. I, I think the rec the recreation. Oh, special permit. Yeah. yeah. Um. So this, right here, you'll see that that looks like on the right side. Where can you? Am I you showing? You can't see your screen. No. Yeah. Can you pull that up? Well done, I certainly can. 
And it looks like the site oh, there it is. Sorry, the I, I clicked on it. I see where orientation it is. of the new trees with the island. That it's we, the professionally done plan in yellow and orange. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, right here is the, the spot, the baseball. So that I'm assuming the baseball cages, the batting cages, and over here is the fitness center. And then, but and Stefan, obviously, the, all all we're discussing now is that special permit. Nothing to do with trees. Right, right. Uh, they, they were supposed to resolve the issue of the trees with a neighbor that wanted to sell the property. I don't know where that is. Well, somebody tells me we'll have a chance to talk about that soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I didn't look at this to see what the parking requirements were. Um, if you want to hold on a second. How many people on that fifth in the center? Um, in the narrative, they said it would only be three employees with two to 12 people per class. I don't know if there's only one class at a time. That's what I would assume based on the size of it, but. The um, parking regulations don't discuss a fitness center or recreation. Well, community facility, town building, recreation, et cetera, is one parking space per 400 square feet of gross floor space. And they're going to be using 3,600 square feet, so that'd be nine spaces, right? Yeah, but plus the batting cages. Which would have a okay, similar. What, is, what about, what did, what did we approve originally? Because we don't have the whole plan here, do we? So. My recollection um, were they were contractor bays. And so other retail service offices, that would be, that's where it fits. But they it doesn't generate a lot of, um, vehicles right how many square feet is this does it does the application say anybody do that being that they're using two parcels at 3600 they're probably 1800 a bay there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven bays so that would be so that's 10 spaces oh i see what you're saying 1800 square feet total States ample parking is available in the front of the building as shown on the plan. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if this trend continues, and this building ends up being more, you know, various uses, then you know, yeah, then yeah they're arriving. Gonna look at, they're going to have to look at increasing parking out back. Right. I think there was room out back. You know, we, that had come up at the last meeting. Well, well, and at the last meeting, didn't they get rid of a couple of spaces? I thought they didn't. They added a couple. Remember, they moved the dumpster. Yeah, they got rid of the parking island and created more of a. Uh, oh, that's right. You that's kind of see it in the site down plan on the drawing. south end. That's right. The dumpster. Is that, that's where that discussion came up with the with the abutter about the right. headlight? Is right. that in this drawing, or was there a later? Yeah. So see down, go down to the very bottom, go up, yep. and. Uh, that History was so they moved the dumpster and then those what is that four or three or four spaces those were added right yeah and then that main sort of island of parking at the front they had that was extended and they added something there right there here too. yeah, Somewhere yeah instead of there. being like a circle it was oriented to more like a strip yeah so i mean i'm a, i think the parking is fine right now um Again, with the rest of the building being contractor base or you know a warehouse, but you know after that we'll have to. 
Well, then you'd need to evaluate. I mean, if it's just contractors that are coming in and storing equipment and then moving in and out a couple of times a day, but. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like the use of this building right. may be changing, but, you know, it's right. with a nod towards economic development, right? Yeah. I'd rather say a building with a, with a fitness center than a building with two vacant bays for the time being. Yep. I agree. Motion to, oh, I can't say that. <laughs> Wrong committee. I'm not allowed to make motions. <laughs> do we need it? Do we, we need a motion? Is that how we've been well, doing usually it? If we, I, so we, this is a request for uh, comment. So we can take no action or we can comment. So if we if we feel we're recommending approval, then we should, yeah, make a motion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with, with that. Yeah. So. Mo motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, strange eye. Anderson, I. Okay, then I. Stetson, I. All right. Uh, meeting minutes. Anybody look at them? We can do them next time if you want. It's been a long night, I understand. That's fine by me. <laughs> Not that I don't love looking at your guys' mugs, but. Motion to approve the minutes for. There you go. That's okay, Chris. Be, be aggressive. Nine twenty-one. Oh yeah, Second. these are short. Yeah. Okay. A second. <laughs> uh, did I hear a second in there? I got garbled. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Strange eye. Anderson, I. Yeah, they might. That's an eye. Great. All right. Well, kids, thank you. It was a long night. Stephanie, Suzanne. Craig, Pam, was that everybody. a motion to adjourn? It's going to be. Yeah. What, do you have anything? <laughs> oh, okay. I have one thing I'd just like to, it, it just came up today. I was waxing poetic. <laughs> I know. I was, and I was, I was entranced. So I didn't, um, yeah. Um, so you folks should all be receiving an invitation to a Canoe River Steering Committee kickoff from Andrea Langhauser. This is related to the Municipal Vulnerability Plan. And it's actually coming out of the effort that um, one of the action projects that we received grant funding for was removing the um, concrete foundations down at the Wright Farm on town property and restoring the floodplain in that area. And the group that they're working with um, called SNAP, and I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what it means off the top of my head, but they um, are working with communities on climate change adaptation. And I just wanted to mention that you are invited to attend that meeting and talk about nature-based solutions to cl uh, building climate resiliency within the Canoe River Aquifer region. Well, thank you. Is it the foundation for the old blue silos? Is that what that is? Yes. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, but that's so. This is kind of an um, an offshoot of that. It's just to continue gotcha. looking at other opportunities. It, well, thank you. Yeah, you sent that to us, I think, right? Didn't you? Andrea did send it, and I just yeah, wanted. And I, I think I saw that today. What, right? it, what it was about. <sighs> okay, so yeah, so this is good. We can wrap up hopefully next time our. Um, our uh, deliberations on the zoning. And I thank you all for uh, putting in, it's been a while since we've had a three hour meeting. So at least we don't have to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to bring us home with a wonderful motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. 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 Thank you, Stephanie. All right. Thank, thank you, thank you everybody. Suzanne. Thank Good you, Kim. As always. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.